Hello, everyone. My name is David Reed, and I am the host of Dial the Gate, episode 155. This is our State of the Gate. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you are live, you can submit questions to our um, our team who are in the uh, chat right now waiting to uh, take your questions for Jenny Steven, our industry veteran and, and Hollywood marketing guru who is going to give us the lowdown and the latest on what's been going on uh, with MGM. If you are new to the channel and... Uh, would like to see more content like this, please feel free to uh, hit that like button. I would prefer it if you do. It helps the show uh, get uh, a little bit more exposure and popularity and will help YouTube uh, uh, grow the audience, help help YouTube grow the audience. Please also consider sharing the video with a Stargate friend if you find the information insightful. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes and clips from this live streaming will be released over the course of the next few days on the dial the gates uh youtube channel possibly gate world as well depending on uh the information that comes out this is a live show jenny and darren are going to be with us again the moderators are standing by if you have questions about mgm or about the stargate franchise and its future um, the moderators will be getting those questions over to me, and we will be uh, uh, seeing where things go. Without further ado, Jenny Steven of Clio Consulting. Hello. Hi. How are you guys doing? A little sick, but but good. I know. Darren I'm Sumner so of GateWorld. Hey, Dalgate. We're glad to be back. So I've happy been, to have you both. People. I've been getting people pestering me with all the MGM news this year. When yeah. are we going to hear from Jenny again? And when are we going to do another State of the Gate? So perfect timing. There's so much to cover. I'm very yeah, thankful I mean, to I have you we... both. So Jenny, please. Well, well, and I think if we had done this earlier, we would have missed all of this news that just came through in the past two weeks. Yeah, right. So um, so one of the first things I'm going to do that will make you guys laugh that know me is that so I've tried to make the family tree of MGM and Amazon. <laughs> And if you can see right here, it makes absolutely no sense unless you start breaking it down. So let's break it down for okay. everybody. It's bigger than so, it was last time, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, at least last time we had MGM in its own silo and Amazon in its own silo. Now, all of right. those lines are mixed. So Goodness. I want to start by saying this is pretty typical. And everybody, Darren, Sidetrack, everybody's talked about this online. David, we've talked about it ad nauseum every time we've gotten together. When a major studio is acquired, there is 10 months to three years that it takes for that acquisition to assess the people that are in that acquisition. How do they fit? Where are redundancies? And sometimes they're surprised, right? They may have had some um, preconceived notions of how they wanted that to weave together. And that is what happened here. There were some preconceived notions. Those didn't work out. Some of the early um, exits like Mike DeLuca and Pam Abdi, they kind of knew that they weren't going to fit because they knew that those positions existed already at Amazon Creative Studios. Oh. So it's a little er earlier than I thought it would happen. 10 months is a mm. little early. But having said that, there was a lot of time during which the SEC was assessing the deal. And that's when Amazon and, and MGM were having a lot of meetings. So this is normal. And if you wanna compare it, for instance, to the Fox acquisition, which is the one I have the most personal experience with, this is exactly the same type of thing that happened. So what we're looking at right now is Amazon and its heads assessed with MGM who made the most sense, and especially when they're looking at what is the goal for Amazon Studios, for Creative Studios with MGM's content. And what's the goal with all of the different divisions that MGM has, like Orion and Annapurna and just a bazillion different divisions and how that was gonna work. So the best way I can break this down is that Amazon had its own restructuring happening at the same time, not to make it more confusing. So what they- As a result now, of MGM coming in? No, no. This was gonna was happen this, anyway. Yeah, Amazon had okay. two years ago or, or right after COVID 2020, they had yeah. their own internal restructuring of how to work the company. And it took a while for that restructuring restructuring to kind of filter out who fit, who didn't, who wanted to move on. And then there were just some natural 
movers on. Like Jen Salka just took over for a, just a brilliant woman that exited. It, she just wanted to go on and do her own thing. So let's break some of that down. Can we, All of before, that. Before we get too deep into the weeds of, of the players and the positions, can we kind of, yeah. I imagine there might be some new people in the audience who are vaguely aware that Amazon has purchased MGM, but from the Stargate perspective, the sort of short recap of what we're doing today is Mm. uh, the deal was announced in May of 2021 and it closed in March of 2022. And as Stargate fans, we've then been waiting for some news, right? Is is Amazon going to pull the trigger that, that MGM had hesitated on for some new Stargate project? Uh, we knew that Brad had written a script a couple of years ago and that that was basically a victim of COVID. Uh, and you had said, I remember very vividly in one of our previous conversations, you had said, maybe it's possible that Amazon comes in and sees Stargate here as this low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. It's a script that's ready to go from one of the guys who co-created the entire franchise. Right. They could pull the trigger quickly and clearly they didn't. So now we're right. kind of we're we're watching from the outside. We're watching the the business development and the the executives moving their chairs around, right? Uh, with the hope and the anticipation that the the whole reason Amazon bought MGM is to make use of their library, and that right. includes Stargate. So, mm -hmm. in addition to putting all the shows on on Prime Video, which they've done since we talked last, at least in the right. United States, which was uh, a big question mark that we weren't yeah, sure that because of distribution. Yeah, we talked about last time, um, and. I'd love to hear if you think that's going to eventually be international on Prime Video. It, it will. But we're also looking ahead, right, to some sort of new Stargate project, whether that's Brad's or not. Is that a, a kind of a fair roadmap of where we've come from? From No, that's a perfect roadmap. I love when you do that. That's <laughs> brilliant. It's brilliant. And, it's, and to answer the question, just quickly tangential of where the existing Stargate content is. So yes, it will it will be international. The problem, as we've talked about before, is that there were existing international distribution contracts that had been signed, sealed, and delivered as of 2020 prior to the sale, even early 2021. So some of those need to finish out. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be transferred. So if you think about it in old school syndication, and we used to watch Stargate. I mean, it's it's. I found it on Showtime, but then I was able to rewatch it on syndication. So syndication is when your original broadcaster, or in this case, a streamer, resells its content to other distributors around the world or internally in the U.S. One of the reasons that still happens is, let's be honest, streaming and internet penetration globally is still only between 68, 74% of the quote unquote TV watching public. Is that all? Market. Yeah. And it, and it depends on, you know, eMarketer says it's less. Um, Global World Index says it's more. So it just depends, right, on what you're qualifying as. Are they receiving it on their cell phone? Are they receiving it on a desktop or their TV? So that's what changes. It can be anywhere from 52 to 74%. In the U.S., it's one of the lowest. For a first world country, we That's have one of the lowest. What, what do you, why do you think that is? Because our rural areas don't have the pipeline to get it to okay. them. And, okay. and then honestly, because unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon where you fall on the political economic strata, um, our competition market, free market, means that you have, in some areas, you have no competition, and in others, you have multiple, mm -hmm. and prices are very high where there's no competition, and a lot of times that's in rural areas, and they can't afford it. Yeah. So they stick with cable, they stick so with- So they have they nothing else, really. Right? So they're on Cox or yeah. Spectrum or whatever, but they can't get, they can't afford to get the streamers. Okay, okay so that's, and that's also, that's it's a luxury. And what's yeah. interesting is what's considered cable is genuinely, it's streaming now. But that isn't what some of these guys that are doing the Global World Index, that's not what they consider streaming. So, again, part of it is we don't have a standard of measure. We don't have a standard of phrasing. So all of that comes to bear on the international market and when we can get it to all of our international territories. And I know Amazon is better than others at making sure that it gets those individual territory and market licenses as fast as possible. So I, I don't doubt that it'll happen. I think it's going to depend on, um, hopefully they don't send sell individual shows. I think what they're trying to do from my understanding with their restructuring two years ago 
is that it's prime video in general would be distributed to all of these international territories as and opposed to the things that amazon boasts about is prime yeah. videos global availability so when they launch right. a show like rings of power they say it's you know the the press releases say it's available in 240 countries and territories mm -hmm. Haha, ha, there's not 240 countries in the world. They right. and territories. Correct. Right. 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 That's right. And they break it and they break it down like that too, because which is ironic because Benelux is Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. Right. But then you have Australia and New Zealand, which is divided into four territories. So, you know, it's it's a mess. Yeah. But, but this is, I, we talk know. about the, the importance of the international availability of Stargate, of, of the existing shows yeah. on Prime Video or another service and of the the p potential of a future Stargate show and new Stargate show being available yeah. globally same day is right. mind blowing compared to what we used to have to deal with between Showtime and Sky and, and all the other right. global broadcasters. Well, and, and obviously comparisons are odious, but Amazon Prime Video gets compared to Netflix on a regular basis as it should. And when you look at Squid Game and you look at what Netflix has done and the time that it put into this mm -hmm. to have its global, I mean, it's spent an average of about seven to eight years having all of its uh, availability in, I think it's in, uh, I have to go back and check. I should have looked this up before, but I think it's in like 78 countries. So seven or eight years to get it to that level of market yeah. coverage. Well, sure. Because yeah, because mm -hmm. they had to, Who's got access? Start with yeah. first world countries. Then you know, Work and, your way out. and and also they had to imagine seven eight years ago they had to convince people that this was legitimate. That convince production studios you want to spend the money to dub or subtitle this to get it. I mean, there's a lot of dominoes that go into this. Hmm. Now, you know, KCRW just had a a, a show a couple of weeks ago where they were saying, well, it's going to take Amazon seven to eight years. No. Because obviously what Netflix has done, like anything that happens- They paved the industry, way. They paved the way. Right. And so yeah. Amazon can mimic that. Right. Also, quite frankly, with their, and, and this is, they have a phenomenal international group at Amazon, but MGM's international group is pretty amazing. And while I know Stargate fans are frustrated, the people that are in there that are doing the work are extraordinarily experienced in international territories and they were just absorbed into MGM. So you've got people who are coming over from MGM with a lot of experience in this area. So, you know, the hope is that these contracts and distribution deals will slowly be uh, finished out. And then Amazon Prime Video Global can say, great, then we want to move forward with this Stargate. And quite frankly, it could happen parallel, which is what I'm hearing they want it to do, be, is that they want to push forward. That's why they've put everything back on. All of these are good signs. They've put everything back on Prime Video. They're trying to work out these distribution deals. They've just woven in people from MGM that they think will have the best impact on the franchises, the top six franchises, which we'll talk about in a bit, which includes Stargate. So all of those things that are happening are the maneuvering of a normal acquisition. Yeah. And all of the details, like international deals, are part of those details. And the last thing I want to say about our, our international Stargate community is uh, the international community is hugely important to MGM and now to, to Amazon. I see lots of comments of folks who are like, you know, North America gets all the attention. They get everything first. They right. get stuff on Prime Video. Uh, financially, the global market is hugely important. So we talked when, when SG-1 yeah. was on the air, we talked about it being, you know, a billion dollar franchise for MGM. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, it doesn't come from the deal with Sci-Fi Channel. No. Right? The deal with Sci-Fi Channel, the license with Sci-Fi Channel helps fund the production. Mm -hmm. And I right. think the show probably more or less broke even at that point. But it was MGM then taking the show to syndication. Right. And then globally, SG-1 was in what, like 175 countries. That's well, and there... where MGM is making its money. And their deal with 20th Century Fox, which is where I came in and started working with them, was to distribute home entertainment internationally. And so that's where the absolute explosion happened. And that was in 2002 to 2004 is when that started to just take off. Because that's where so much, that's why we were able to make the movies, is because right. that's where the bank was coming from. Right. So this, as we read constantly, I, I, we have a super smart audience. And... Stargate fans in general, I have said from the beginning, are, are one of the earliest fandoms to ask for the curtain to be pulled 
so we can see what's happening behind the scenes in production and direction and show running. They are very aware of the fact that international money is absolutely where it's at. I'm working on a new sci-fi project right now. We aren't shooting in the US. We're going to shoot in Mexico. So our production is going to be Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. And it's because that's where we know that the money is. And that's mm -hmm. where the distribution. And then we can distribute in the U.S. And that's happening so much more because, quite frankly, while I love the U.S. audience and I want us to be there, that's not where I can get production done. And it's not where my partners who are doing production can get it done. So there's no question Amazon and Netflix are leaps and bounds ahead of a lot of the studios when it comes to that. And it's not that Warner Brothers, Sony, and all of these guys aren't extraordinarily aware, as we just said, because it's where they made their bank, but they're a little bit slower to jump onto the distribution part of international in their shows. So Peacock, Paramount Plus, et cetera, aren't necessarily as quick, even Disney, to get out to international as Netflix and Amazon are. And, and again, that's because they've had more time, frankly, to build that pathway and to get out there. And that's a great segue into what's happening at Amazon and MGM to make Stargate happen. There's, as you know, you guys have all read Gate World. I'm sure everybody listens to David and watches Dial the Gate with the interviews and Sidetrack. And there are so many rumors going around. Mm -hmm. And some of them are spot on. And some of them are spot on for that moment. And then they're not. So this is, you know, this is the bottom line. I'm not dealing in any rumors because it'd be too easy to go down that road and Quite honestly, I, I literally did a whole bunch of research prepping for this this week, and four of the people I talked to contradicted each other. So it's just, okay. and that just has to do yeah. with where they are and what they're and what they know. They're, That's right. the hot mess of production. Yep. Exactly. And so, and you know, and I had promised them I wouldn't quote them anyway. It was yep. just background. But honestly, none of it really pans out for our conversation. It'll be interesting to yep. see if any of the things that they're talking about come true. But I'd rather just deal in where the facts are right yeah. now. Okay, perfect. Um, so what we've got is this. So Amazon had its own restructuring, like we talked about. And a guy named Mike Hopkins has taken over as SVP of Prime Video and Amazon Creative Studios. Amazon Creative Studios is the production company for Amazon, just like any other content division would be at MGM, any place else. Under him, as everybody read this week, is Jen Salka, who I love. She is amazing. She was at 20th Century Fox. She was at NBC Universal. She's done things like This Is Us, Chicago, all the Chicago series with Dick Wolf Productions. She's got very, very solid creative talent connections in this world. Um, when I was at 20th Century Fox, she was my, you know, fourth level up boss for Family Guy and things like that. So <laughs> she's amazing. She is now, as of three days ago, the head of all of Amazon Studios, film and television. She came from the Amazon side. She was hired from NBC Universal. She's been at Amazon. Now she's in charge of all of that. Under her, and this is where things get weird, so I'm going to quote this, and where we care. I'm not talking about unscripted, but I will talk about film division. So this is where things get a yeah. little confusing. And um, David, because... I'm a freak. I'm actually going to make this as an org chart and send it to you so you guys can post it because yeah. I'm a freak about stuff Yeah, like absolutely. We'll put it in the link to the description below. I just didn't have time to do it as you saw my chicken scratch. So, <laughs> this is the MGM so here's, integration part, right? Pardon me? You're getting now to the MGM integration part. Correct. So Vernon Sanders is on the Amazon side. And what they've done is they all had meetings with Jen Salka with all of the MGM people in scripted television, unscripted television, and film. We all saw that Mark Burnett left. Yes. So I'm going to have a little sidebar right now about Mark Burnett. No surprise. So, <laughs> I worked with Mark Burnett at Fox. I worked with him at MGM. Brilliant. I will never, ever, ever say anything other than he is a brilliant guy when it comes to unscripted television and coming up with good ideas. Eight years at MGM, not one new show that worked. And while I was there, was not supportive of Stargate at all. 
Okay. And hmm. in fact, threw up roadblocks to start it. And he was on the board. Oh, that's interesting. Now, so I've he's never been able to survivor. say that. Publicly. He got Survivor under his belt. He's got the voice. But yeah, since he joined MGM, he sort of brought his whole unscripted division into MGM. And but there was nothing new. We didn't see much come of it. No, no, there was nothing new. And again, that's not to say that happens all the time with production. You know, you bring somebody sure. in un, as a shingle, quote, it's called a shingle under the parent of the studios because you want them to bring in something that is creative and new and the whole bit didn't happen. And from my point of view, not just for Stardate, but for other creative content that I saw go across scripted development's desk, talking with the people over there in uh, scripted content with Steve was there with Rob Hochberg, Chris Ottinger, stuff didn't happen. And it was a hindrance. And as the article that I sent you guys, KCRW and Hollywood Reporter were more uh, critical than I am about that they say he was an agent of chaos. Now, I didn't see that, but it may have been that at the top, you know, on the board. I All I know is he wasn't a fan of Stargate, didn't want to spend the money. Yeah. So, so he would have had a say on Stargate, particularly just absolutely, because he was a member of the board. Well, and plus he was head of television. Okay. While so we were, while we were, script. yep, while we were in the middle of Stargate Command, he became head of television. Ah, I so see. It was a little bit of a transition, but he was on the board at the time, then becomes head, head of television. And he just, you know, look, whatever his reasoning was, which I don't know, because I wasn't present at those board meetings, but the, the news that trickled down to the rest of us was he and Nancy Tellum, who was the head of the board at the time, were adamant that Stargate just was not where to go. Okay, that's, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I, you know, there were lots of fights about it. And, you know, credit to Michael Brown, Simon Grady, Chris Ottinger, mm -hmm. who literally threw their bodies across the line to try to keep it going, make it happen. John Dax, all, you know, people who lost their jobs. And it just, it's unfortunate. I'm not really sure why it became the line we do not cross, but it did. So that's my little sidebar. So Mark Burnett leaves. He's no longer head of television. And now we have coming in from MGM, Chris Brereton, who was our COO of all of MGM. And he is going to be in charge of MGM Plus and MGM Alternate Television and uh, oh, Prime it. Video yeah, Service. I'll, I'll do the footnotes for the people. MGM Plus is what Epix is going to be starting in January. Yep. That's uh, MGM's now owned premium cable service, which you can also get as an over-the-top streamer. Exactly. And the, the MGM alternative hasn't really been defined exactly. It's supposed to be the upscale MGM plus, plus some other things that are going to happen. Chris Brereton has been pretty amazing. Now he's uh, what I, what I have my entire career called the difference between the creative guys and the bean counters. The best studios are the ones that combine both, that you have one of each. Chris Brereton comes from a bean counter background but he has always worked hand in hand with creatives, always. And in this case, that's exactly what's gonna be happening. He'll be working with Jen Salka and others. Of everybody, I am so happy that he's coming over. Um, and separate from that, Chris Ottinger will also be coming over. I, I'm not gonna talk about it, but licensing and merchandising or what's considered acquisitions. Amazon's a little bit different in its hierarchy. It's got, uh, couple of new people over there. Chris Ottinger will be over in acquisitions, which is, you know, essentially what he was doing at MGM. Um, he'll only be reporting, you know, one up at that time. Um, marketing, Sue Kroll just came in at Amazon. Uh, Steven Bruno will be coming over. So the supplemental divisions, we can talk about that another time. Okay. But I know the names Chris Brereton and Chris Ottinger. I think Chris Ottinger I met on the Midway. You did. Correct. He did. He was, and, and those again, two Chris's are both on, on Team Stargate, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ottinger, and definitely. And Ottinger yeah. definitely is. Ottinger is a huge geek. Huge yeah. geek. So it's not just Stargate. Like, he loves uh, Robocop. He loves mm -hmm. all of it. He's also very much about the international distribution. So he's the one that's the big drum beater with... Uh, his department about making sure that international distribution happens appropriately. And he gets streaming. So, in streaming. So he'll yeah. be there. 
Chris Britton's the name to remember with, and this is important, Michael Wright. So Michael Wright came from Epics, came over to MGM, was in charge of scripted development at MGM, and now he will be in charge of all of MGM+. Plus. So Chris Britton's, uh, you know, essentially his title is going to be, I'm at Amazon Studios and I'm in charge of all of the SVOD stuff. So MGM+, Plus, MGM Alternative, Prime Video for Corporate Strategy. Then Michael Wright, who is a huge Stargate fan, is in charge of MGM+. Plus. This is really, really good for us. Mm. So I want to repeat this. You have Jen Salka, who is just a huge talent supporter. She loves creative concepts. She loves creative television. Under her will be Chris Brereton. Well, Chris will actually report to Mike Hopkins, but whatever. Chris Brereton will be running corporate strategy for Prime Video, MGM Plus, MGM Alternative, and then Michael Wright, also from MGM, will be running MGM Plus, where if Stargate's going to go somewhere, it's one of the places, and I will address this rumor, it is one of the places that is most likely right now where Stargate would go. But we'll address that content thing a bit later. Okay. The second part of this that's really important is you've got scripted US and scripted SVOD television. And those are the ones that are going to be actually making the decisions about what ideas go forward. And there's brand new people there, both of whom are huge sci-fi fans especially Lindsay Sloan, who's in charge of the U.S. one. So okay. all of the, now they're not from MGM. They came from other places or within Amazon. Yeah. Those are those are the basics. Now there's a lot, but those are the basics. And the, the thing that we need to really hang our hat on is all of this restructuring all in MGM, weaving MGM people into Amazon. Because let's remember now MGM doesn't really exist as its own silo. Now it's woven into Amazon Creative Studios. It's under essentially Jen Salka, Amazon Studios, television and film. So one of the things that I wanted to address when it comes to that next is content and distribution, which we've already talked a little bit about international distribution. But content, where is it going to go? Does it go to the film division? Does it go to scripted television? So I want to address, this is one rumor I want to address because I think it's important. There are probably three or four solid rumors out there about the fact that Amazon went to MGM and said, look, we love Brad Wright. We love his, his ideas. We love his universe. We're not thrilled with his script, which we've all known that for a while. It got, you know, it got put on a back burner. MGM loved it. MGM banged the drum for it. They really wanted it. Their division really wanted it, but it really didn't fit. And I think this is fair how Amazon was looking. And, and I want to break this down for people because I think this is really important. When Brad wrote that script, it was appropriate for where MGM was at the time. It would have only, he wrote that script and submitted it prior to the sale, prior to COVID. So his plan and his, his decision-making with his own production company, with Chris, with uh, the head of scripted television at the time, Steve and those guys, it was a completely different world. Mm -hmm. So what he wrote and what that was going to be and what that series was going to be was appropriate to that particular setup, that equation. Yeah. The variables aren't just changed, they're blown apart. I give Amazon and MGM credit because they kept Brad on the table this whole time. Mm. I don't think he's gone per se. I just don't know what that equation looks like with him in it. And we've all seen the tweet from Brad I don't know that he's talked to anybody, you know, when I talked to him, he hadn't, but I just, I think, I think he's just looking at, Hey, it's been essentially on the back burner. It's right. a different setup now. Let's just be realistic. Yeah. That's my guess. Now we've got Amazon woven in with the MGM scripted. We have new people in scripted development now. And a lot of MGM scripted people came over, but the heads are different. And you've got a whole different setup about how it would be distributed. Amazon has said from the beginning that they were more interested in establishing this as a massive franchise. And that's where I think we need to look at this positively. That yeah. while we would love Brad to be a part of this, all of us would. From when we first did this last summer, a year and a half ago, 
all of three of us and everybody following and and all of the new channels and all the people that are talking about it have said the same thing. We all love Brad, but we all want Stargate. And we know that those two may not meet. So not for I the next think, chapter. I don't know. You know what? And I got to be honest. This is where talking to the four different people, I get very different stories. And mm. so considering that this infrastructure just change just happened, I think we don't make any conclusions about that. I think it we just look a, at a different chapter where Brad just plays a different part. Exactly. And he has some, some kind of involvement and, uh, the, the world that he helped to create doesn't go away. Uh, part yeah, of the yeah. concern, I think part of the, our, our preoccupation with Brad as fans is not just, we, we love him as a writer and as a creator, right? Right. The shrine, abyss, I mean, come on. Yeah. But also uh, we love the, the world that he made and we don't want to reboot. He's we the symbol to... of that right. tangent of Stargate canon from the feature film. Exactly. And exactly. they could just and think... be done with it and say, okay, what we're going to new, do next is a different tangent. And they could. And, you know, look, we've said this from the very beginning when we talked about this last year, yep. that every time we hear a rumor or we talk about it, that's true at that moment. Yep. So when we talked about the fact that Brad was having meetings with the MGM, that was happening yep. after the sale. But nothing came of it. And so his pilot, that series, like I said, was part of an equation that no longer exists. So let's look at what does exist. Amazon wants this franchise to be a massive franchise. And they're looking at three different ways that this can happen. You start with a film and it goes to a series. They are very interested. And I, I, I'll have, I know, David, I think you're going to list the articles yep, in deadline. the description. Yep. Um, yeah, but this is the movie web article, which is, um, and there were, and I'll, honestly, it was also the deadline article. Um, got it. I've got an Amazon web article up. Has committed a billion dollars to theatrical events content. Part of what was quoted by Mike Hopkins, who's above Jen Salka, was Stargate, but he listed all of their franchises. So I don't right. think we can. When the deal went through, he listed every, basically all the big high profile MGM exactly. franchises. Exactly. And he just repeated with... that with this new news. Yep. Good. So they, I think this was, I can't remember, this was two weeks ago. Uh, think, November 23rd, they, yep. Yeah. So, so what did they right say in this? That Amazon wants to put like four movies in the theaters every year, something like that. Well, right. So, and and what they want to do, I think the number is important. It's a billion dollars a year. Hmm. So let's, let's look at that in context. Netflix spent $6 billion over the past two years on new content. Amazon's looking at a billion dollars a year just for theatrical content. Eight to ten films. So I, and annually. I think that's wow. what they're looking at. So that's, great. that's one of the ways this could happen. Okay. It could be a film. And I'm not getting into who would write it, what we would write, what, yeah. what canon. It would be a film, and they would then want a series to back that up. The second way they could do this is that it is a series, and we start with a series. And one of the reasons they would do a series would be one of two reasons you've got content on the table already there are rumors that there is other content from the expanse writers there's rumors that mm -hmm. there is other content from um the boys group yeah. production company there's i mean i've literally like i said it's it's all very messy so i think what we need to look at there is if a series gets started we don't know who would be brought in but we do know this it is unlikely that Amazon, if you look at their history, is going to cut out the fan base in the existing canon based on what they've done in the past. So for instance, looking at what they want to do with MGM when they've talked about RoboCop, what they want to do with MGM when they've talked about Legally Blonde, they're not going to throw out the canon completely on these. They're not going to throw out the universe of these when they've, and this, these are ones that are, one of them's already in production. So I think we can feel comfortable especially with jen salka and others who would be in charge of this they're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater what it looks like i have no idea because like i said there seems to be literally three different lookbook content bibles on the table right now but a, a cold fresh start is not at this point very likely based on I, what you're reading the in the third, tea leaves 
that's my third option. And this okay. is where I don't, I don't know. The third option would be they would do a complete reboot, start from fresh, have it be on MGM plus, and it's its own thing. That doesn't mean that the others wouldn't happen, but that could be the third option if they think that that is something that they can financially get going quickly. I mean, I, remember, Brereton and Michael Wright are going to be looking at what content can we populate MGM Plus with the fastest. Mm -hmm. And that will be existing catalog, and that will be new content, and that will be content they buy. And um, I think one of the hard parts about this is that Amazon, as you know, a number of other people have talked about recently, so I'm not going to redo this. David, you've talked about this. Darren, you wrote a whole bunch of articles. Sidetrack actually did a great breakdown of this. Amazon doesn't necessarily create its own content. And so all of this also depends on who do they go to? What's their idea? And like I said, there's three or four rumors and people who have quote unquote seen things that I've talked to on the table, which are all over the place. It covers the spectrum. It is a movie that goes into a series. It's a brand new series. It's a complete reboot. It's living in the universe, but explores people we never you know, it's it's crazy. And when you look at the conversations about what's happening at DC, and I think that there are parallels here. The there's a TikTok, and I'm so sorry, I'm blanking. I will I will get back to you. But there's a guy who did a TikTok that is absolutely brilliant in 60 seconds, where he says, Hey, so James Gunn, so happy that you're here, so happy that you're on board. But we just need to go through the list of things that you need to make sure that you do. And then he goes through the list of, okay, so we have a Batman that's a standalone, but then we have, we don't want to, you know, piss off Joaquin Phoenix. And then we have three Jokers. And then we, and then he goes through the whole thing. And then we have Suicide Squad, but we love your first one, not so keen about the second one. So we like these, but we don't and like Green these. Lantern, please. I know, oh my right? gosh. Oh love my God. Off. I know. I would love Green Lantern. I would flip over Green Lantern. And then we love Gal Gadot, but we don't like 84. So we have to retcon that. And it's, I'll get you guys the link. It is a 60 seconds where I keep watching it because I just start crying. I'm laughing so hard. But that's they've got but so what, much in play. So many balls in so the much. air, you know, with so many different creators behind it. Some are still, you know, there. Some are out. It's like, what do you do? What, you know? And this is, I think, what encourages me about this is I want to repeat. Michael Wright, Chris Brereton, Chris Ottinger, and a couple of others that have now been absorbed into Amazon, where they are reporting directly to the people who are going to make the decisions, and they themselves are making decisions about what content is going to be on Prime Video. Chris Brereton's in charge of corporate strategy for Prime Video. Part of that strategy is franchise management. So what franchises? Obviously, Stargate is one of those, and it's been listed as one. It's been listed. Uh, right now, based on what I've heard, my guess is that they, if they can do it, they want to start with a movie and go to a series. And they really genuinely want to make this a tentpole franchise. Cool. What that content is, I'm hearing, like I said, from one end of the spectrum to the other. Uh, completely in canon, they're going to bring Brad on, but it's going to be a whole new group of people that are writers and the whole bit. Uh, a complete reboot. We're going to nod to Brad Wright. We're going to nod to Roland Emmerich, but otherwise, screw it, we're doing our own thing. Oh, and by the way, let's just remember that there's Lionsgate waiting in the background who owns the movie of Stargate. But it's all it's all crazy. And I think one of the things that's exciting for me about this is, oh, my God, we finally have this structure in place. They are finally going to start yeah. to make decisions. And MGM Plus is supposed, supposed to launch January 15th. I'm not sure that's going to happen exactly the way they plan it, based on what I'm hearing. Yeah, what's in it? But I mean, yeah. But this, this announcement over the, these announcements over the past two weeks is earlier than I expected. I expected them to make these announcements in January because that would have been a year and that's normal. I think they're fast tracking certain, certain franchises, quite frankly. I know for a fact they're fast tracking, or at least not a fact. Again, sorry, I want to separate. The rumor I've heard is that they fast track legally blonde. So my understanding is that Star that Stargate is one of those top five franchises that they are trying to fast track. Why do you suspect this has been moved up in time? You think that the they're seeing that the, I, the circle is closing down in terms of the the volume of streaming services that are out there, and they want to get they want to get their seat at the table faster than originally. I, I think it's I think it's multiple things. Okay. I think that they had to wait a year 
to have this action for the deal to go through. And I think that there were people internally like Mike Hopkins who had been working with higher ups at Amazon to have this infrastructure in place and all that they were waiting. I think he had the infrastructure ready. I think he had the org chart ready. I think he was just waiting for the right people. And then of course, some people left that he didn't expect came on board. So honestly, this could have happened this summer, but they lost some people they didn't expect. I think that it is in in the time frame that makes sense if you think about the year they had to wait for approvals i think they had a lot of time to talk with mgm i mean i know they were having multiple meetings on a weekly basis with mgm folks during that year and so i think that there was already conversation i mean obviously there were because mike deluca and pam abdi left within whatever it was two weeks of the announcement I don't think that necessarily, in fact, I know they didn't have the scripted TV figured out at all. Um, I I don't think Mark Burnett was ever going to stay. I just think, how was that going to go? Was he going to have a shingle under Amazon? I think those were the decisions. I know those were some of the conversations going on. So that makes sense. Hmm. Then I think the other thing that pushed this is end of year. They lost a lot of time with COVID. They had enough in the can that they were like Netflix, that they were able to really push a lot of streaming stuff out and have some closed sets that they could get some amazing things done like the boys. And certainly they were doing pre-production for Rings of Power, Mm -hmm. but now they don't have a lot in the can. And I think they want to make sure that in this restructure, and I shouldn't say they don't have a lot in the can, but, but when you're Amazon, you want to have 20 to 30 ready to go over a two year period. Yeah, a little bit of everything spread across multiple genres for different audiences. Exactly. You don't want to go out of the news for more than a couple of weeks. No, and you're not a you're not a film studio where you can release four to nine movies a year and be okay. That's that's not how it works. So, you know, and I think that their announcement about doing theatrical is ballsy. I mean, it's it hasn't been proven that that can work, but I think that if I'm comparing Netflix and Amazon, I think Amazon has done a really amazing job where they released during COVID in 2021 and 22, they would do a week or a two week theatrical and then it went straight to prime video or they went straight to prime video, but they treated it like it was a theatrical release marketing wise. Mm. I kind of think that was brilliant because what they were doing was doing AB testing and it didn't really cost them a lot to do it. And it also kept the theatrical distributors happy. So, and they did that prior to Netflix doing it. So Netflix just did it with glass onion with knives out, but Amazon, I think, did it first, and I think they were doing it during COVID, if I remember correctly. I can't remember what what release it was. So they've done all this A-B testing. So to your point, I think they're ready. I think they were like, you know what? We've got the MGM Plus. We've pulled in Epics. We've done all our work. We've done all the strategy. We did all the restructuring and shuffling that we want to do for right now. We feel really strong about this. Let's get going. Let's get this stuff done. Let's get on, because that's why they bought MGM. They bought it for the catalog. They bought it for, I mean, look, Wednesday was already under production and it went to right. Netflix. It was already part of That's a separate Netflix. thing. Yeah. But, and it did well. Guys, that's good. Oh, it did phenomenally. It was second only to Squid Game. But I think that that's still going to happen. Just like MGM would syndicate to different channels. I don't necessarily think that everything MGM produces with Amazon is going to be on Prime Video or MGM Plus. I, I think that's their their blue sky. But if they get a great distribution deal that gets them international play, right. like like with Netflix, they could have fought the Netflix deal and they didn't because right. they didn't have to. Right. It was like, you know what? This is great. We don't have to worry about it. Netflix handles it. Netflix is doing the marketing. We don't have to spend that money. Hot shit. Good to go. And that's I think one that thing that's, 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 that's one thing happen. that seems clearer to me now after the, the news of the last couple of weeks is that. MGM is not going to get absorbed and everything they make is not going to go to prime video because Amazon's priority is not to shut down Hulu or Netflix. Their priority is to make money. So if they can sell shows to all these different outlets, like MGM has been doing for decades, that's what they're going to do because it's going to make them the most money. And nobody knows the answer either. I just had this conversation. David knows literally I talk about this all the time and I'm so sorry because I'm going to say it again for the millionth time. I literally just had a conversation with a guy that runs a production studio locally in LA. It's an independent production studio, but he's working with Zack Snyder and with all these guys. And he said, Jen, nobody knows what the fuck they're doing because nobody knows what 
is going to happen technologically. If you look at what's happening with streaming, so I'm talking about distribution, I'm talking about production. Nobody knows what's going to work with an audience that is absolutely all over the place. Right. You have the most amount of generations ever in the history of man alive at the same time. Mm. Of those generations, the bulk percentage are looking at, I forget what how many hours, it was like five hours a day on streaming, television, their phone, whatever it is. A day. And that includes sports and unscripted and everything. I'm talking about everything in this content. So we're talking a billion people. Yeah. So out of now 8 billion people, it may be more than that. From the stats I looked at in the summer, it could be more than that now. That means you have this wide spectrum of people who like a lot of different things and aren't liking just one thing. I like sci-fi. I like all sci-fi. I also love stupid Hallmark Christmas rom com So I am all over the place. And I like Chicago PD. I mean, it, it, and I'm not unusual. And so, also the genres of consumption. I mean, not to derail, but how exactly. much money did did Zuck sink into Meta, and now oh is laying God. off a ton because it's, it's too early. Well, you know? and that's that's that is the point, is that it's not just the content spectrum; it's the technology technology platform distribution yep. spectrum that nobody has the answers. Yep. And if you think about the cable revolution. And how that became right. bundling eventually. Yeah. We have, in essence, the internet revolution. And now we have, people are calling it all kinds of things, but let's just say streaming, technical technology, OTT, platform gener <laughs> revolution. It is not just the biggest group of people ever. It is not just the broadest content offered ever. It is the broadest way to watch ever. So none of these guys know the answer. So. This kind of brings it back to your question, David, of was this something they sped up? I think that Amazon is being very smart about doing their A-B testing. I think what they're going to do is they're going to take MGM content. They're going to let it go to Netflix. They're going to put it on MGM Plus. They're going to put it on Prime Video. They're going to syndicate it out in Australia and Benelux and Japan and South Korea and see how it goes. And I think what they're going to do is they're going to look at genres and they're going to get massive amount of focus testing back because mm -hmm. that's what we do by watching it. If you watch it all the way through, they know it. If you only watch part of it and come back, they know that. And they they break those numbers down and they look at where did they watch it? How did they right. watch it? If a lot of sci-fi is being consumed on Netflix, wouldn't yep. you rather put it put something potentially sci-fi-ish there or try to bring them over to an MGM or try Plus to bring, or we had, and slash exactly. the audience numbers? Or we had Expanse was an enormous success and enormous. we were able to have two seasons that we paid for with the production company, blanking on it, the name Panda something. Um, and I think, I think the other thing is this, which I think is fascinating. I think that Amazon is going to play with the content within its own Prime Video and MGM Plus. I think it's going to play with and remember, we still have marketing and licensing and merchandising over here. And I think that Amazon, uh, this is my feeling. I think Amazon is doing a better job of that testing and very carefully looking at how that's going to move forward than Netflix. Head to head, slightly different strategies as well. But Amazon is ultimately trying to separate its creative studios from its e-commerce while also simultaneously having its license and merchandising connected to its e-commerce, which is connected to all of the franchises. And I think if there's anybody that they are comparing themselves to, it's Disney. And this is what I and this is where I wanted to kind of bring this back, that Amazon is doing something very different with its acquisition of MGM. Disney did not keep most of the heads of state from Fox. Mm -hmm. And when it got rid of them, like Peter Chernin and others, it failed. And now they're going to look to bring them back. Hmm. I think Amazon looked around at what worked and what didn't work. And what they thought was, okay, cool. We're going to, we're going to look at those lessons, but also how does it fit our structure? Right. We've just restructured. We've just redone this in creative studios area. 
Prime Video area only. I'm not talking about e-commerce. How does all of this fit in? We've bought it. Now what? <laughs> okay, we, we know we wanted it. We know we needed it looking at the long term for us. 10 years from now, we want to have some of the best content and we want to be one of the major places that people go to look for any of this content, whatever it is. Okay, okay cool. So if you go to Amazon and you're a Prime subscriber, they are the only ones that are genuinely bundling right now. You don't have to go to CBS Interactive separately. You don't have, I mean, Roku does this, but Amazon Prime has its own bundling. You can get Stars and Showtime and CBS because they have deals with them as a distributor, as well as a content creator. Now, I'm not even going to get into the whether or not this is a massive monopoly issue, but and an antitrust. Ah, we keep on wanting waiting, to bring it up, but we have to keep waiting on tabling to happen. It. It yeah. is, I mean, I, and I think we should talk about that we on another show because to. the 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 free market economy ceases to be a free market economy when you have. And this has always been an issue in the entertainment industry. When you have your creator, your producer, your distributor, all in one. And it is, it is. on the one hand, I think what Amazon's doing is amazingly smart. And on the, one, on the other hand, the creator in me is just cringing, going, oh, my God, there's no, there's no competition here. But if, you go, if you're a Prime subscriber and you look at the Prime video list, it will list the bundles that you can do. And it makes it extremely easy for you to do it. And that's the key. More so, of an a la carte experience than you could get someplace like Comcast. That's right. I, mean, I can go turn on and off my my Paramount Plus edition to Prime Video at the drop of a hat when that's Star right. Trek is on and pay nine bucks. That's right. And look, you know, that kind of attrition and churn rate. It, people hear churn all the time. And I, I'm sure everybody knows what it is. What it basically means is if you're... SVOD, which is subscription video on demand, and you only sign up for The Mandalorian and then you you bump out. Yeah, I'm done. That's called, but I'm not going to turn called, my Amazon Prime off because I like the shipping. That's right. So, and that's called and they churn. know that. And see, this is exactly, and this is where Prime Video has done an amazing job where they don't really care. They don't care if you turn CBS Paramount Plus on and off. Um, they don't care if you watch it for one show and then turn it off because you're still on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what... I, I don't know what Paramount the deal knows is. that I'm going to turn it off when right. there's not Star Trek on. So it's it's in CBS's interest to keep Star Trek right. on year, year round, something new. That's so right. I got five shows going right now. Amazon well, knows I got the base subscription. I'm going to go add right. something else. That's right. And I think that that also gets back to our conversation about none of us are single silo content watchers. So what Amazon's going to try to do and what Paramount Plus honestly is trying to do and not doing a bad job of it is say, look, if you're with us, we will be your catch-all. You could go to any genre you want. And the reason we're not Netflix is because we also have all the new movies. We've got, and Netflix gets that, but they don't get all the deals. Amazon gets the majority of the new movies. They get the majority of the deals for new shows. Mm -hmm. And so they, and that, because that's how they started. Prime Video started as essentially a syndication, right? It was a channel like any other they bought the movies. They bought the syndication for the shows. You could watch them there if you had missed it on broadcast. So part of the problem with Peacock is that Peacock doesn't have all of the shows, all of the shows in a series sometimes, especially if it's a new one. Paramount Plus was doing that. It has now stopped doing that. So if you wanted to go watch Ghosts, if you, if you wanted to watch any of the Chicago uh, um, shows, if you wanted to watch Equalizer or Star Trek, it will have all of the seasons, all of the shows if you paid for it. So I think what Amazon's trying to do is say, we are your one-stop shopping, which is really genuinely what they've always been, what they've always done. So I don't see this as being radically different. And this, David, goes back to your point from what they did with e-commerce. It is easy for them to say, okay, we got our structure. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's get it done. Because they've got they've got the resources to get it done. They've got the people packed in there. And they can course correct along the way with what works and what doesn't. Exactly. And they will test, like I've said, yep. like they've already done. And I think that that's, that's a good thing. And here's, so here's what I want to bring to you back that's positive. Let's remember Chris Burton, Chris Ottinger, Michael Wright. Now, I don't know if they're going to go in there. I'll be honest. If I was pulled over from MGM, I don't know if I would go, okay, damn it. We got to do Stargate. I don't know if I would do that. I don't know if they would feel comfortable doing that. 
All I'm saying is that I know that these are three people who supported Stargate when I was there. And I have heard since then that they still support the Stargate franchise and think that it is and has not been that it is not just viable, but it has not been since it went off the air. Truly, correctly utilized and leveraged. And I know all three of those all three of those men feel that way very strongly, that it has never been leveraged the way it should have been post broadcast after it ended. Good. So that's really positive. I think the big question mark is how does Amazon's group that those three people are coming in with who are all brand new and, you know, Lindsay Sloan, who would be the one who would make that decision. She's, Mm. uh, I don't know if it's he or she in scripted television. Are they going to look at other things first? They may have new stuff on the board that they want MGM to do. I don't know. And, and again, remember MGM doesn't make their own. So they have to have a production company that's willing to come in. They have to have a distribution deal if they're not going to do it on Prime Video. That's what pays for it. So going back to the international money. And a lot of times what you've got is scripted television will say yes, but if you can't sell it to a production company, it doesn't matter. It'll stall out. So those are the big question marks. But the positive news is that we've got the right people in there to hopefully say it. And everything I'm hearing from both Amazon and MGM people is, Hey, Stargate's our franchise. It's one of the top five. Something is going to happen. We just don't know what that something is. And it has its own built-in international audience. If they, yep. Amazon keeps on pushing, when we want to create international shows. Yep. You don't have to look farther than the Atlantis expedition to to see that that oh my they, God, they have right? a product that works. And the I mean, half of Dial the Gates audience, you know, forty uh, percent uh, is the United States. The other, the other sixty. I'm sure Darren can relate with Gate World. The other sixty percent, it's all of them. Two percent this country, two percent this country, three percent this country. Yeah. It's it's all the whole planet for crying out yeah. loud. Yeah, exactly. And it's and it always has been. I mean, it's, when we were first doing Stargate oh. Command, I don't know if these numbers are still true. I doubt it. But we had between one and three million active fans still. Of that, it was almost exactly the same. It was. A high 40% in the US and all the rest was international. And that yeah, was in 2019. And that was in 2019. That it's still that way, right? Yeah. Because yeah. the show's been off. People are still watching the show somewhere. It's, you know, it's on Stan and it's on, I don't know, uh, who else is, is airing it in your local regions. But the fact that people can still yeah. find right. the show They're and they don't have searching to for it in Google. If it's online on, on Prime Video or, yeah. or on Netflix. Where right. You right. And, and I think. What I'd be curious to know from your guys' point of view is, you know, I think we've addressed some of the rumors. I think we just need to to say, hey, look, none of us know if any of these rumors are going to come through. Because like I've said, all of us who are talking about Stargate online, on YouTube, writing about it on GateWorld, David talking about it with Dial the Gate and talking Mm -hmm. with talent who actually does talk because they're still in production. They talk to producers and showrunners and people in Vancouver who are all still connected or Toronto or LA. Yeah. All of these rumors may be true at that moment, mm-hmm. but then wait two weeks. It's like whatever they say about the weather in Chicago, right? It's like, wait a moment and the weather changes. Wait mm-hmm. two weeks and the rumor will be dead and then there's a new rumor. Because if you think about it, like I said, the equation has changed. And so your variables are moving parts over at Amazon and MGM. So there's a marketing meeting and the marketing meeting can only deal with what's in front of them. So they've been told, hey, you need to have something ready if we pull the trigger on A, B, or C for Stargate. Well, that gets leaked out and it sounds like something's already done. No, a a typical marketing meeting is always, you have three parts in your marketing meeting. The first is what's just released, what's coming up, what's on deck. Then what's six weeks out, what's the next campaign, and then what's a year out. And you that's always what you're talking about in a marketing meeting. You don't always get to that, to that third one, but that's always what you're going to talk about. Same in licensing and merchandising, which is dealing with three to five year licenses. So, you know, a lot of times these rumors will come from a supplemental department that is completely accurate, but it just doesn't have any base or foundation yet for us to, like I said, to hang our hat on, basically. What I'm waiting for yeah, that's a good is... Way to put it where can we hang our hat where's the information out of out of the now new scripted development television or scripted development film 
that with Chris Burton and Michael Wright at MGM Plus, those four people, when they come out and say something, then I'd be willing to hang my hat on it. Yeah, there are some rumors that might be fake. They might just be made up or speculative. And then there are some rumors, as you say, that might be true in the moment, but they're not going to go anywhere. Right. So it's it almost doesn't matter if the rumor is true or not. And we don't know. Unless it gets to that point where we can hang our hat mm -hmm. on it, where it yeah. whether it's you know something concrete or it's right. eventually it's a press release that is right. an announcement of a production. Well, and I do want to address one rumor that I find fascinating because I had heard this from somewhere else and I know sidetracked did it too. And I don't know, Darren, if you wrote about it, but Mark Fergus, who is uh, The Expanse, has been well, a rumor. I ask you about this. Yeah, so I heard this actually a long time ago, but I didn't put any credence in it because to me, it just seemed like, um, it, let me back up for a second. Scripted development at MGM was asking for lots of ideas across the board for its franchises prior to the the buy as in for people to come in and pitch to them exactly and okay. that and one of and they had been pushing and this was prior to the buy for sci-fi and that's why brad's pilot was was super popular internally and everybody was supporting right. it okay so the buy happens or COVID happens the buy happens and during COVID, it already had been put on hold because nobody could meet then the buy happens and before we had this new infrastructure, you already had new people in scripted development over at Amazon Studios. And they had restructured in 2021 where they have a huge sci-fi fantasy silo. And there was a call from Amazon Studios, Creative Studios, for pitches from production companies. And it wasn't specific to Stargate. This was sci-fi fantasy. Look, look at what we've just happened with the boys. We're looking at, again, going back to a lot of their internal research people and data people were looking at the same things that I was. The report saying the most generations ever are watching right now and sci-fi fantasy is one of the biggest and, you know, obviously superheroes, which is a slightly different division, um, are watching that. It's also why you see a rise in rom-coms in romance because there's a huge section of people that just watch that as well. Mm -hmm. So... And Amazon's I got our user data, right? They know when I turn on my Paramount exactly. Plus subscription for Star Trek and when I turn it off again. Right. They can and add so, and, that and tell, you know, what what's the concentrated exactly. portion of your audience that's sci-fi. And see, this is the other reason I think Amazon is so smart. And again, okay, just always going to say this caveat, the creative part of me is like, oh my God, this is really, you know, antitrust just waiting to happen. But they've because they've bundled these subscriptions, they get information that they would never get otherwise because for instance disney and the rest of these are extremely reluctant yeah, they don't to share. release these numbers they don't want to and you know they're supposed to because they're hey a public company but they don't so it's very interesting um you know netflix has finally started to release its numbers like it just did with wednesday but at the same time they won't release you know after that top 10, they don't release any of those numbers. So you have no idea what's happening in their genres, for instance. Like I would kill to have Netflix research report on their genres. Oh, yeah. 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 They're never gonna no. Oh my God, I would kill for that as, as oh, in my Amazon. particular. Yeah. But Amazon. They've only given, they've only, like Rings of Power, they've only given like a top tier number. Oh, like I know. One, one big, big it. number and no breakdown. Nobody does it. Yeah. But, but here's what they have, even creepier, Jenny. But what they have internally, here. is they've got access to that CBS, to that Paramount Plus, mm -hmm. to the stars. Right. Because to... of all those bundled subscriptions in Prime Video. But let me ask you the really creepy question, which is <laughs> Amazon owns AWS, Amazon yeah. Web Services, and they own a lot of the backbone infrastructure for other platforms, like right. Netflix uses AWS. Yep. So do the executives at Amazon know some of no. Netflix's numbers? It, they that... might. That no, there's there is a that. yeah, there is a genuine firewall literally mm. between AWS. Well, and, and one of the reasons is a couple of reasons. Um, the FCC, which is the Federal Communications uh chair and the entire department that and the FTC, which run the trade, would would come down all over them. I mean, as much as I'm frustrated that that there aren't enough antitrust suits or at least meetings about some of these acquisitions. The one thing they've been hyper about, as we've seen with the Senate uh, hearings with Zuckerberg and others, is the separation of tech, the tech you own, and that distribution of content. 
AWS exists as a completely separate company. Now it doesn't mean that, you know, Bezos doesn't, you know, own it. And it does get a little weird when you've got Washington Post and Netflix and all of these on AWS, let alone, let's not even get into the e-commerce that all use AWS. So Amazon's competitors like Walmart and Target and others are all using AWS. Yeah. But so there's a firewall. There's a firewall. And yeah, but is that is, like a third party that's monitoring that? I mean, how would we really know if Amazon says, yeah, I, I, Amazon's the fox guarding the hen house when the hen house is, it has all right. of their content and in there and everyone else says, oh, no, we don't look at it. How would you know? Right. You and know I think, unless you had someone to put the infrastructure that knew well, how there to are read checks. the infrastructure. Okay. There are checks and balances, but in terms of a third party monitoring, I will say this. There is supposed to be an FCC monitor that does an independent audit i think once a year of these of all of of all these guys i don't know if that happens quite frankly because of resources mm. um not it's not to get political but a lot of these departments were cut back drastically post 2016 they lost a lot of people they lost a lot of resources to do this kind of investigation to do this kind of just straight up monitoring and reporting that's been built back up but you lose four years of which in that four years, AWS became one of the biggest server farms, essentially, for lack of a better word, for all of these competitors that are on the same servers. But but they are supposed to be monitored once a year. They are supposed to check in and give uh, annual reports about what's been happening. Honestly, I would say, having been in this industry long enough, there are, I am sure, lots of people who have shared reports <laughs> <laughs> because right. that's just, that is the way it happens too. I mean, there is some interest in that. Like Netflix would say, hey, I know you're not supposed to share this, but can you just give me a top line of what you had at AWS for traffic, right? For something. And someone might share that verbally. I think that if any of that did happen, I'm pretty sure, it, uh, look, I would like to think the best of people. I'm pretty sure people would be reported pretty damn fast. Hmm. So the creepy question is legit. And I think we have to keep asking those questions because the more you ask it publicly, it's not behind any kind of um, filter. Uh, the FCC and FTC um, monitoring is public record. Okay. So anybody can look it up. If it doesn't exist, it means it hasn't happened or they didn't file it because you don't have enough people to upload it to the site. But it is supposed to be public record when they've been monitored. Well, thank you for satisfying my question. This is <laughs> sure. always the best heads, right? when we're well, ultimately we're dealing with these giant faceless corporations and yeah, and more and more things are owned by fewer and fewer companies. Well, and it's again, like I said, Amazon on the one hand, I, as a user, I love the ease of it. Mm. As a content creator, I love the fact that there's so many different ways that this could be bundled and my content could be distributed. Um, and I'm not a content creator, but as a, as a producer of people who create content, I love the fact that there are all these options. As a creative person and an independent consultant, like I said, it makes me cringe because it worries me. However, and this is the one thing I do want to bring up that is something that I would love for us to talk about again. It is 100% a, a wild west frontier right now. There is technologically how you get your content and how it will happen a year from now, two, three years from now is going to be wildly different. And the best way that this is applicable to what's happening with Stargate is to think about it for anybody who was alive and working in the 90s is that after the writer's strike at 87, there was a massive change within the studio system. And that's when Kirk Kikorian sold off a lot of the MGM stuff to uh, Ted Turner and there was a breakdown of the studio system. And from that was a rise of independent studios and independent producers, independent showrunners in television. It's when you started to see a real breakout in the cable system where you had producers who were only producing content for cable, mm -hmm. not for broadcast. That had never happened prior to between 1987 and 92. Yeah, not the big three. What are you going to just throw it away? Yeah. I know. And it was, you, know, you had ES, ESPN and CNN starting. Um, but of course, CNN... Uh, broke its success, all of it, on the first Gulf War. That's when they started doing 24-hour right. genuine content. But for people who were wanted to create content and put it somewhere else, that was that rise. 
we can liken it then to that. And then in 97 to 2000 was the rise of the internet and the fall of the internet companies that didn't make it because it was, you know, ro rose too fast, too fast. collapsed. But mm -hmm. what happened with that collapse is you have the, the ones who could really deliver. And the same thing is happening with crypto and blockchain. You're having the rise of the ones that don't work, it'll collapse, and then you'll have the consistency. You have also the rise of OTT, which was crazy three years ago. COVID happens, it was even crazier. Then it OTT. kind of collapsed. Over the top streaming. Mm -hmm. Sorry, over the top streaming, yeah. So if you think about all of the different distribution channels, and I say distribution channels li literally, all the different places that you, you as a user and as a producer or a content creator can deliver content, whether it's YouTube or streaming or independent production companies who just put it out there on their own on different channels, Twitch, which is now creating its own content. It's, it just uh, has a scripted content department now. There are so many different places that you can get content. It's the mm -hmm. wild west. It makes it hard for users. And this is brings it back and the reason I brought it up, the reason the bundling that Amazon is doing is is I think positive for us is that there are so many different places that Stargate could be out and it might not be in Canon. It might not be something that we'd be interested in. It could be this little thing over here or this little thing over here. Having it with Amazon, mm -hmm. I genuinely believe outside of Disney was the best place for us to land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That financially it'll be, you know, it'll look good. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there, there's a lot at play. And yeah. like every time we do one of these, I, I'm less and less likely to think that it's going to be Brad's version of the next something. But yeah. you know, at the same time, as long as it's Stargate, you know, that's it's yeah, that's the reason I fell in love with it. Right. You know, for right. me. So uh so is there before any... I... yeah, Darren. Sorry, Jenny, before I interrupted you with that question, we were talking about um MGM, Amazon soliciting pitches, and Mark Fergus. And it, as far as you know, oh, right, right. Any um, in, in the rumors that some of the more successful genre shows that have been on Amazon, like The Boys and The Expanse, yeah, that those writers have pitched or have been invited to pitch something Stargate related. Right, and it's it is that that rumor is true. And what happened was is that you had the MGM people who had done it prior to the buy, and then. Amazon, because of its sci-fi silo, had sent out the call for lots of sci-fi fantasy and still are. It's still a silo they're really working as well as procedural and some others that they've decided to focus on. So one of the things that was done was that they would say with certain production companies that they had either already worked with or were really excited about, like Mark Fergus and Hawk, his partner, and said, hey, we loved what you've done. What would you like to do we'd love to get and they said uh, my understanding is they said starting now i've okay. i had heard this prior to when uh sidetrack had talked about it i didn't i didn't know for sure if it was real because again you hear a lot of comments sometimes or, or rumors that are um what's the word i want uh trying to make something happen right yeah trying in, to spur it Right. Like do a thing. Loved, do a thing. They would have loved Mark Fergus to do this and he I would be amazing. Sense, right? We right? look at sci fi shows that are on the platform. Right. The Expanse is one of my favorite shows of I don't know, the last decade of probably my adulthood. Right. And, uh it just it makes sense to look at those shows and say, Ooh, wouldn't it be cool if the creators right. of that took a whack at Stargate or if John's not gonna have a chance John to John Krasinski it. as, you know, uh, yes. Mr. Fantastic. That would be right. so cool. Exactly. And then they give him a movie where they do it. It's like, oh my God, now we've done yeah. it. Now we're moving on. And well, and, or Deadpool. I mean, honestly, yeah. Deadpool happened 100% because of fans and because Ryan Reynolds saw that, was a fan himself, made a fan film. So yeah. it can happen that way. Now, that, that's only one group. And I, I can't talk about the other ones I've heard about because again, I don't know for sure, but this rumor has been out there. And so there's a couple of things that I would say to this. I think that if this is true, it makes sense. They were very successful in the transition over to Amazon. They were very successful working internally with Amazon. You're talking about the thing I would, guys? Yeah, Mark Ferguson and those guys. However, like. it's not all the same people. So there is that, you know, now we've got these, we've got new people in. Some of those people that they had worked with have left. We've got some new people in. So I'm not sure where that is. Again, it's kind of like the Brad script. When right. that transition happens, 
when this transition just happened over the past two weeks, obviously this had been talked about for a while. So it could quite frankly be that Jen Salka had already been talking to these guys and said, hey, heads up, there's gonna be a lot of structure changes, but we still wanna get your, your Bible, your pitch. So, oh, for everybody to know, so there's something called a Bible, a lookbook, and a pitch. And usually it's in that order. And what it is, is that if you're developing a franchise, you want to create the Bible of what you want that franchise to look like. What are the worlds? What are the characters? What's the story? Then you would make a lookbook of what you think that should look like, including who are, sometimes you don't always do this, but including who are uh, the actors and actresses that you would love to have be involved with this or what they should look like. And mm -hmm. as we have Give you gotten- an image. Exactly. And as CGI has become so easy, most lookbooks now in presentations will actually have a CGI AI created world or lore or world building for it when you're doing the pitch. So then the full proposal pitch, if you get past those, you know, you do the, the Bible, are you interested? Yes. Here's the lookbook. Ooh, this is cool. We want to see more. Then you do the full pitch, which would include pilot, usually an extra episode. What's your arc? What are your beats? Um, how do you see this playing out? Is it a limited series, a full series? Um, how do you, what's it going to cost? So that's after the lookbook, you have to give your budget. And that's where you start to say, okay, it's not the boys. You can't say 10 to 15 million per episode. I, I don't think that you can come in with Stargate and say, we're going to do 10 to 15 million per episode, but I don't know if, if Mark Fergus and his partner Hawk are the ones doing it. My guess is they will be close to that 10 million an episode in wow. their pitch. But because that's what they that's what they've done. That's what they know. And they know that's what makes it look good. And that's True. what you can really do on a 4K or an 8K with all the right, you know, surround sound. This is what you can really do. Yeah. And even if you don't have that, it would still look good. So I think that there is quite probably something on the table in the works with Mark Fergus. He is the most obvious. But the other rumors I've heard honestly could be just as good and just as legitimate and realistic because they have current contracts with Amazon. Or there's one I've heard that's a production company that has a contract with MGM already with one of its shows and Amazon, but they're not available. So, you know, you know, there's all of these little variables that have to come into play. And I think right. what we as fans have to hope for is that those variables, the logistical variables, don't become what makes the decision. What makes the decision is, is it a good piece of content? Does it do what we want to see for Stargate? Is it in universe? Look, there are lots of things that you can do. Star Wars, whether we like it or not, has been successful in saying 10 years ago, eight years ago, okay, everything you've read before, all of the other things that were supplemental are legends. They're not in universe. They're not in canon. We all went batshit crazy and said, are you kidding? We were tearing our hair out. I was one of them. I was like, what the hell? And I had worked with Pablo, yeah. who's head of All Creative. And I'm like, dude, this was your world. How can you do this? He's like, be patient, be patient. And what they did was they started cherry picking. Mm -hmm. And they said to Dave Filoni, who do you like from these different worlds that can fit in this canon that we've now said is the real canon? And what they've slowly done is they've woven in the best Thrawn in my opinion. and you know yeah, yeah. exactly and pieces can still with, fit and they can still fit and then very slowly and this was absolutely their 10-year plan this is not something that just happened along the way where they go oh hey look Thrawn fits it, it wasn't like that this was a very long arc and what we as fans should hope for is that if they draw a line in the sand and say here are all the things that, that we're pulling from Emmerich's, this is all what we're pulling from Brad's, but we're going to start over. What we would hope is that it's good content that's yeah. being made by people we trust to do good sci-fi storytelling. Mm. That's that's where I am right now. And I, I, I like Amazon's choices of who they've decided to move. We, whether you like Rings yeah. of Power or not, yeah, the storyline was good. Whether or not the writing and how it was executed was how I would have... Yeah, I, it wasn't and I, I'm not really sure why that stumbled because these are great actors. This is great production. The storyline, I mean, I would, you know, I'd follow that storyline anywhere. Well, but, haven't the two producers at the top ever made anything before other than just get a nod from J.J. Abrams? Not, not big. 
Yeah. yeah. And I think that that shows. And and again, yeah. that may be why we really want someone like Mark for this, who yeah. has a proven track record. Yeah. And what I'm hearing from the folks internally in Amazon is international is huge, is huge for their friend, for the TV script and mm-hmm. TV franchises. They've got strategy that they want to put in place for these top five franchises, which, you know, everybody, it's, you know, Legally Blonde, Stargate, um, Robocop, uh, um, Rocky, Rocky, and who am I blanking on? Bond. Bond. Oh, yeah. Pink Panther. <laughs> Bond, but I don't count Bond. Pink Panther actually is one of the ones that it's just, they keep stumbling on Pink Panther. So, and there's Vikings more. I mean, Vikings. you've got Vikings, you've got, they've got so mm-hmm. much. I mean, they still have a contract with MTV for Teen Wolf. They want to remake it. That's the current news is that they're going to do a remake and a reboot of Teen Wolf. And you don't know if you've got good people who have been there and part of it, it could be an amazingly awesome creative storytelling experience for us as fans. Yeah. I think the lesson from Origins that I, if I were to delineate what I've read and have repeatedly over the years of, of uh, since that project had come out uh, and what fans have talked about since then, almost like yeah. as derisive as, as universe is if you're not going to put the appropriate amount of money and mm-hmm. energy into this thing, don't bother. Right. It, I the, the the collective group of Stargate fans, I I think it w- would come down to this basically saying, don't give me another one if you're not going to put your money where your mouth is and if you're not properly be all in. do it. Yeah, yeah, I agree, well, and I I do think that Amazon has the best is position <laughs> to use correct. a very cliched phrase, but it is accurate is positioned as one of the best where MGM yeah. wasn't. I mean, quite honestly, guys, MGM wanted to. Yeah. They were all over doing Brad's script and it just, they couldn't get to the finish line. A lot of that was financial. So now yeah. you've got backing whomever they may partner with. And again, this comes back to as fans, we want to wish for you know, Mark Fergus's company, JJ Amberg's company, whoever it is that's being rumored out there, you want to be partnered with a production company that has the experience, number one, and the money to bring it over the line. Yep. I've got, uh, uh, Jenny, is there anything you want to to wrap up and con- conclude before I bring in the, the fan questions? No, I think I covered all of them. I think you did. <laughs> My outline so. points that I sent. <laughs> I think I've covered everything. So. And Dan, Darren, I'm going to need your input on these uh, as well. So these, a lot of these are for both of you. Dan, Ben, can someone, Jenny, thank you for your analysis. And yes. Darren, oh, gosh, thank you for yeah. your commentary. <clears throat> Dan, Ben said, can someone explain how that uh, mobile app game is able to do Stargate events, i.e., uh, Ar- uh, is it Ar- Arcalis? Astro Kings. Astro Kings. Yeah. I haven't Astro seen Kings. anyone else do anything with Stargate. And as far as I'm, as far as I am aware, I think that's the first and only crossover that we've had. In the, so in these the are four week integrations. They've Astro Kings is an existing yeah. mobile game in a sci fi universe, and my understanding is they just go to MGM and ask for a license. They've done it three times now, mm-hmm. uh, and each time it runs for four weeks and it's an integration. They they bring in Stargate characters and Stargate ships. You can get the Odyssey in your game. You can get Carter in your game, uh, and then when the promo is over, you get to keep the characters and ships that you've earned. Right. Uh, it's a but it's a item. way for yeah, it's a way for Astro Kings to go out and promote their product and try and get new users on board. Using and it's a way for MGM licensing and merchandising to get some quick money mm-hmm. on a franchise that they couldn't get approval for some licensing with the Amazon buy. Mm-hmm. And and to this point, that I will as soon as I can, you know, put this in an org chart. <laughs> um, Brad Beal is the name of the guy who's in charge of licensing and merchandising and acquisitions over at Amazon. And uh, Chris Ottinger is going to come in under him. And that is an amazing combination because you've got someone who's a huge geek who mm-hmm. loves all of the really cool franchises like Vikings, like uh, Stargate, like Robocop, Good. and and wants new, wants to develop new stuff. And what this Astro Kings deal did was it was a bridge, essentially. So this Astro Kings, and I forget, Timekeepers, right? That was the other one? Yes. These deals were done prior to the buy. 
Okay. So they had to be finished out. I mean, they could have canceled them, but you know, look, it's a great way. If it didn't create a lot of problems, it was a great way for Bob Merrick, who's over at MGM in charge of element uh, licensing and merchandising right now to bridge this time. You know, you want to keep going during yeah. this time. You don't want to just yeah. go, go, go dormant. dark. Yeah, exactly. And it was a great way. And, and I'm so sorry, I'm blanking on his name. There was a, a kid who was in charge of interactive games over there. And I don't know if he's still there huge stargate fan and he's the one that pushed for this he's the one that pushed for both of these and i darren it was the ones that we wanted to interview and then the sale happened and nobody wanted to talk right so you know was this one of the mats one of the mats exactly i know one of the mats left yeah one of them left and the other one that stayed um and i don't remember which one left and which one stayed but they were so lovely and i had talked to them early on and they were so excited about this and the way to do this crossover and to dan's question the reason you can do it is you have to have kind of everything line up they had somebody internally who was a stargate fan who pushed for it you had somebody internally who thought you know what we need to make some money this is a great way to do a transition and then you had somebody internally like carol mora and a couple of others who were able to make sure that it stayed in canon Mm -hmm. across these these places the brilliance of the astro kings in any crossover that you do that's an integration is that you have usually four weeks is short usually it's a six to eight week window when you do these in gaming and they are a lot of times they're just paid campaigns for a particular um project that's coming out in this case what was just brilliant about it is is they were short four week campaigns you get these digital aspects you get the integration into the game you can play with it Astro Kings gets to reach a new audience. Stargate gets to reach a new audience. MGM gets money. Everyone <laughs> wins. Happens. Yeah. yeah. I, if, you really if you hadn't had those people internally to help, it wouldn't, it. it wouldn't work. That's how I, that's what Sorry. I heard from both of you. So. All right, Darren, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just reiterating the point you already made, which is that you've got, just like with a show, you've got to have somebody inside MGM pulling mm-hmm. for this. Yeah. I mean, how much, how much does Stargate owe to somebody like Charlie Cohen, who's inside yeah. it? Uh, yeah, exactly. Gobs. It's got to happen, and I'm just going to keep pushing until it's over the finish line. Yeah, Same that's right. Licensing. Somebody's got to not only be willing to, to, you know, take your check when you right. come waving money in MGM's face, but actually be an advocate for the Stargate brand. Well, and I under, and understand it. And Ibrek asks this. This dovetails off of the other one. Bryce uh, asked, uh, could, "Is SG Timekeepers postponement due to Amazon, the publisher of Slytherin, and the developer Creative Forge created Slytherin Poland, which is now responsible for the development of that game? Where's that at? Money. Yeah. Development for what time? Keep, this is this is my understanding. And Darren, I know you've talked to them as well, but this is the same thing, David, that you and I went through. Okay. Um." four times with games is that um, development money dried up, but that wasn't just because of the Amazon deal. Okay. It was also because we lost one of the mats. Who oh, was so that was, kind of that's the big... with them. Okay. Got and it. then resources, you know, internally at, at MGM, you can, you only have so many people who can do things to get it through. That's true. So I think, I think unfortunately that one was uh, a, a victim of a couple of different things that happened at the same time. Um, I don't know that it would have been back burner due to the deal because we knew the deal was coming through when I was there. We knew somebody was going to buy MGM. Um, and that was in March of 2020. So, and the timekeepers deal happened right after I left. So I okay. think, I, I, you know, I don't think that it was just about that. I think it was just, unfortunately it was bad timing. Okay. Last thing we heard publicly about timekeepers was they, they showed off another level earlier in the year. I think it was maybe January. It was, it was a good while yeah. ago. And they were talking about potentially having a, a beta testing in the summer. It looked Maybe really it was- good. Yeah. And uh, th- I mean, these guys have been making strategy PC games for, for two decades. Mm-hmm. They know what they're doing yeah. and how to get games to market. So uh, it, it fell silent and now it's December. So I tried to contact them recently. I don't have a comment from them yet about where it is, but that's kind of my speculation was um, towards the line of maybe in this you know, licensing and consumer products has to also have its own transition That's a- right. after the Amazon acquisition. And, and it's uh, a big, it's a big, I don't know if it's got lost. I don't know if it's on the back burner or if yeah. it just needs another. I don't cash either. Uh, no, I know. And I, 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 I right did now. reach I out. Yeah, I, me too. I, I did reach out, but I haven't been able to talk to them. That was on me um, before this, uh, before our show 
about where licensing and merchandising was, but I got to be honest, they probably wouldn't even have talked to me because they're in the middle of that restructure. Mm. That's, you know, yeah. it's all going to move under Brad Beal. Chris Ottinger's coming over, but nothing was mentioned about any of the people, David, that you and I have worked with for years. Okay. So I don't know how that's going to fall out. And I think that some projects that were not quite finished in production or in pre-production won't happen. How's that transfer? You know, these are licenses. So they might just let the license go away. I, you know, yeah. Wyvern Gaming is another one. It's, they had a license. They were buying the license for Stargate Atlantis. That's been put on hold. So I think a lot of those happen that way. You know, with Timekeeper, it could be something as simple as, okay, it didn't, we got through trying to test beta and oh my God, now all the restructuring is happening. Guys, we can't do anything right now. But I don't know. I, I know a lot of Stargate's licensees have, uh, they've gone through the ringer of MGM's approval process, which oh, is not God, yeah. consumer products, but it's also legal. And yeah. MGM has, has earned a bit of a reputation for taking their sweet time. <laughs> get approvals to their licensees. So that's also in play here. It could be that yeah. the game got far enough that it, it's now ready to yeah. kind of hit some of the, the approvals process. Right. And meanwhile, everybody at MGM is is well you know, preoccupied and with that's it. that's a show i'd like to do with you guys because i think one of the things that i've moved into a lot because of fandom development being in this area is consumer products licensing and merchandising and collectibles mm -hmm. so i started working for 20th century fox consumer products back in 2010 i think um and it was a simultaneous parallel job with my job that was internally for content creation for fox and that cross-functionality didn't happen outside of Fox. Any of the other places I worked, it was not active. Wow. And David and I had yeah. to bang the drum to do cross-functionality at MGM. And thank God we had two people with Simon Grady and Michael Brown who believed in it. But I mean, they literally forced it to happen. So I would like to see an e-commerce company with a creative studios shingle. How is Amazon going to handle that? My gut feeling is that they're going to be much more open about cross-functionality conversations. And here's the perfect example. Bob Chapek at Disney. The first thing he did when he was hired was to stop cross-functionality between the e-commerce division and the creative content divisions. And people internally were furious. A lot of the content guys, the teams were just infuriated. The minute Bob Iger came back, he got rid of that. He got rid of the guy that was in charge of e-commerce that Bob Chapek had put there. And he recombined those so that you have teams of commerce on content and content on commerce. That would be how I would imagine that Amazon's going to do it. That you're going to have Brad Beal, who is an Amazon person, who they just brought over Chris Ottinger for MGM. You have the person who knows commerce, who knows licensing and merchandising and acquisitions, combined with someone who is a huge geek, who gets content, but who also gets the business side. And I don't know who they're going to bring in underneath them. I didn't, I couldn't find probably because they don't have everybody in place yet. Mm -hmm. um, I would be fascinated if Amazon doesn't do a better job at this than Disney. And I will be highly disappointed if they don't do a good cross functionality between licensing and merchandising, collectibles, mm -hmm. consumer products. And I would love for us to have a show about that yeah. because the one thing that I think the Stargate fans as a whole can agree on is that licensing and merchandising opportunities have been lost over and over Hand and over and fist. Over and over. Oh my gosh, yes. I just did the uh, 2022 holiday gift guide for Stargate. Oh, cool. Boy, that made me sad. Didn't it? This is, is what we've back? got. I yeah. started with 2021 and I pulled stuff from that article. And okay, the shows are on Blu-ray. That's great. And and uh, boy... Got a couple Eagle of books. Yeah. We ended up with yeah. three ships, and then Eagle Moss went into administration. We've had no new novels for three years. We've had yeah. no new comics for a, a couple. Oh of my years. god! Yeah. And uh, and so we have all the same stuff we had last year, and and less. And I don't know I mean, what you've else. Got, you've got people that are individual licensees, or people who are individuals who are flying under the radar because they're not making enough money on Stargate to care. Um, or to flag anybody. <laughs> T-shirts, <And>, anyone? <clears throat> I know. Um, I think, I do think that that's going to be a problem. That's why I think it's a whole show in and of itself. Yeah. I will say this. Yeah, we I could talk about that. licensing for two hours. The yeah, one thing I would that love came that. back this year was Big Finish. Yeah, 
And that was but not that, new content. That's that was true. a re repackage yeah. of the existing audio dramas. But at least it was something, you know, and it's, it's, I think who's going to suffer the most. And I, well, I don't know this for sure. I think the biggest question mark, I should say, is going to be the individuals who want to make like rock love jewelry and some of those. I think they may be some of the collateral damage that happens because mm. Amazon is not good about its affiliate programs, about its independent sellers. Now, I know that they've tried recently to, to genuinely overhaul that. And, but I don't know how that would start to work with integration with its creative studios, with franchise IP. Okay. Uh, Jenny, a uh, wink and a nod to a certain uh, channel on uh, YouTube. Um, Woodclerk Hawk wants to know, uh, does anyone take, uh, how, do, how do we take these channels with anonymous but unverified sources inside of MGM seriously? Or do we just consider them clickbait? No, I absolutely take them seriously. Not all of them, but I, I think, I think, again, it goes back to, look, Anybody who's a huge fan who has tried to source people internally, even though they may be third or fourth concentric circle out, just watch it and listen to it with knowing, okay, that's that's cool. That sounds really interesting. A, it could be a rumor that's true right now that won't be true two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. Or it's a rumor that will develop, which is usually what happens. It's like this Mark Fergus rumor. You know, it's like I said, I had heard it before, then, you know, Sidetrack, he got it, a source who says that they've seen the Bible. Okay, cool. Awesome. I would love that to be true, frankly. Um, and then now what I've heard from that is it's actually slightly different. So I think what we do is you, you watch that as a fan and you think, okay, cool. That sounds amazing. Or, oh my God, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> and you just take that into consideration that the sources Everybody has anonymous sources. Darren and I for years have had to play that. Mm, where I've been an anonymous source for him on background information. So everybody uses that in journalism and in any kind of YouTube channel that get in the gate. All these guys, everybody has different sources. David's got super deep sources on the talent side. He's got super deep sources on the showrunner. And I'm not side. telling. Exactly. And so he'll say, hey, and what you've seen with David and what Darren do is they come at it obliquely where they say, okay, that's background information, but now I'm going to ask a question that basically takes that information and I'm going to ask this person mm -hmm. who may know more and therefore that can verify this background information. Separately. And that's separate. And what you look or we at- don't have, We don't have a source on the record, but having yes. something in the background can allow us to shape how we talk about something on a podcast or a live stream exactly. or maybe exactly. shape a, mm -hmm. a, an opinion piece where we say- right. Wouldn't it be interesting if, if this right, kind right. of approach was taken? Yeah. And I think what you do is you listen to all of this, and if it's corroborated by a couple of different places, and you go, oh, cool, we've just come in our concentric circles. And I think you pay attention to it, and you listen to it if someone seems to have consistent sources that some of those rumors come true, well, then I would say, yeah, pay attention Ooh. to it and, and yeah, absorb well, that as a fan. and say Exactly. And- and look, again, I, I want to say, I, I don't, I found it weird. Somebody, uh, I can't remember one of the other, one of the other YouTube channels accused the sidetrack guy of lying. And I thought that was really awful. Um, any of these people who are genuinely fans who are doing this and they're doing it because they love sci-fi, they love Stargate. Cool. Yeah. The more the merrier, guys. Yeah, you can't assume I mean, they're just doing it just for clicks. No, exactly. So. I mean, it's you could say you guys all know David because he's put himself out there for years. You all know Darren because he's been at all the, the conventions. But some of these new guys, they hadn't they didn't have time to be out there for you to know their mm. face to meet them, especially during COVID. And so I don't know that we we throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think as fans do your own research. I mean, I the research that I did. There's so much information available if you just go search on like, literally Deadline or Hollywood Reporter or MovieWeb or comic book resources. These guys have a lot of information. And what you do 
is you just compare and it literally could take you an hour and you just look at, okay, what's the one thing that they all both that they all said? Okay. Then that one's probably pretty true. And mm. that corroborates what you're seeing. And then just as a fan, enjoy it. My God, if someone's out there <laughs> saying really, really cool stuff, you'd be like, Oh my God, that would be available. Or, Oh, holy crap. That would be awful. Cool. Then comment about it. Get into a conversation. All of that is good because it means that we're out there. We're talking about it. That means Amazon sees that there's, you know, David has over 20,000. Sitrek has 14,000. Um, Get in the Gate has something else. The Gate World's has almost 100,000. Uh, Gate World's at 100,000. Holy this crap. Month. I mean, the Companion has 7,000. All of these are not overlaps. Right. Because people look at different things for different, In different information. Ways. So I say, enjoy it. If it gets corroborated, great. I doubt seriously that most of these people are doing um, anything other than really being genuine fans. And if they're repeating a rumor or have gotten a rumor or gotten information, then that's true at that moment. That person was in a marketing meeting. Remember what I said earlier, a marketing meeting is siloed. You know, they don't necessarily have the showrunners coming in and talking to them or the head of scripted development. They're given the marching orders, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if your source is at the marketing level, that's genuinely true for that marketing department, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's happening in scripted development. It just means, hey, heads up, you might want to have this on your back burner. We get the, we used to get those all the time. Hey, there's going to be three Viking shows, a prequel, uh, a branch off on The Sun, and a sequel. Well, okay. One it's like Walking happens. Dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we had to be ready for those. It's so I, I, that's that's my answer. And other people may feel differently. Three out of four of them don't come to pass. Well, it's, right. Darren had that hot take article uh, that they should green light three shows simultaneously. And Raj, yeah. Raj Luthra asked here if they could continue SGA and SGU where they left off. Wouldn't doing animation be better? And that's, I think, if if we follow Darren's hot take logic, you know, that would be if they could green light more than one show. That right. would be how I would do it, you know. Well, that was, I think that I, was, I loved that article, Darren. Pitch. Loved it. Well, yeah, that one came out of obviously, you guys know me, that came out of my frustration of uh, sitting around waiting for so long and, and having nothing. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, and you know, it's just, it's, it's an attempt to express to MGM and Amazon that their fan base is here and their yeah. fan base needs to be taken seriously, right. obviously. But, uh, yeah, I'll just add to the, the previous conversation. You guys know I came from a journalism background. Right. Journalism training. So Gate World has always been sort of uh, sourced. It needs to be yeah. sourced or we're not going to publish it. Right. And rumor sites and, and rumor channels are part of fandom. Mm -hmm. And the, the the stuff can be fun to watch. Jenny, right. like you say, it's it's entertainment. But um, I hope people understand it for what it is, which is it's it's rumors. It's it, often it's single source. It's somebody right. who, you know, knows somebody who knows somebody. Right. So just take it for what it is. It doesn't always come to pass and it's not always true. Um, so it's a different, if, if it's information or entertainment, it's a different kind right. of information than what you're getting from, you know, a variety or a deadline. You know what? And, and also, you know, I just thought of this. Part of this also is if you go back to like the marketing department, right? Each of these departments are asked and tasked to do different things for these franchises. All of this is put in the pot to the decision makers. So when I was at MGM, I had to do four different proposals for Stargate Command, what was going to happen next. I so I had that. to do one oh my for gosh. all different types of goals. Yeah. So Chris Ottinger's was the biggest. He wanted to know, you know, what are we going to do for distribution? Will we use YouTube? Because remember, three years ago, not everything had monetized yet. So for that kind of thing, you do a pitch, essentially, mm -hmm. a proposal. Mm -hmm. Well, I hired a company to make my deck look pretty. And so I know that one of the rumors that was out there came from on Sidetrack's side. That's completely legitimate. That's a legitimate source. They are giving you something that is accurate because they made a deck for a pitch for Fergus for it, you know, to go or, or Bad Robot to go over to Amazon. The context is it was lack that. Of context. Exactly. Right. And or it, something's or, right and something else in the rumor is wrong. Right. Or and and I think I think they've all gotten very careful now about saying, hey, this is one source of a source and this is what I've got. And 
you know, it's this is rumor or this is just somebody's opinion. And I think people have gotten a lot better, I've noticed, on a lot of the mm. sites to say that mm -hmm. as as qualification. But Good. the context here is still leaves that rumor legitimate. And that context is Amazon's sci-fi fantasy silo asked for pitches from production mm -hmm. companies. Okay, that's the context. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. It is a legitimate rumor. It isn't sourced beyond that. And I think to your point, Darren, that's what the difference is, is that they're true. It happened. But the context is, is that we don't know what happens next. So it was true in that moment. That happened. It's fascinating. I mean, we could go in depth about whether or not we want Bad Robot to be part of this, but it doesn't necessarily do anything for the long game. And Amazon plays the long game. And I think that what we do as fans is we depend on it. it look, I'm going to, and I'm going to be, it gets everybody even, dead, out. even deadline reports rumors. So, and the rap reports rumors and they'll qualify it as rumors, but they are considered journalism sites for entertainment. I read them every day in the morning. It's like the first thing I do, but you have to just kind of absorb it and then you wait and see. And that's what I will always tell fans is cool rumor, cool information. I love this shit. I'm sorry. Sorry. I love this stuff. I will watch all of the channels. I love all of it. I think it's just, you know, I am a gossip hound for this stuff, but I don't take it to the bank. It only has a certain amount of weight that comes with where it came from. Right. And that's Time. it. You can't sit and let it sink your boat. So, that's right. what, I mean, the lack of discernment among the audience is is a challenge to me as a content creator then because folks aren't discerning about the type of information that it is that they're that they're digesting. Often so, not. Right, folks will come on our channels and say, you know, hey, uh, this thing that you just said is wrong or is outdated uh, right. because Brian Johnson just got a green light to make a, a $200 million right. Stargate movie. Right. right. And right. they will right. die by that. Yeah. And right. no, he didn't. It's just a rumor that we heard. Uh, right. And for all we know, maybe Ryan Johnson was in the office pitching the movie and well, got a really and good. And you know job. how those meetings go. No, no. Uh, these meetings are the best, but it'll be Ryan Johnson came into Amazon because Amazon saw knives out and said, oh, you know what? We want to do something else. And we are having all these pitches that are done on procedurals and mysteries and thrillers because it's not just sci fi. And oh, my God, let's get Ryan Johnson in here. And Ryan Johnson comes in and says, oh, my God, you guys got MGM. Do you guys know how much I love RoboCop? Yeah. And they say, oh, but what about Stargate? And from there, yeah. everybody's off and running. Right. And yeah. and it's I think here's here's the only thing I would say to both of you about the audiences is that. You guys and I know that most of the people who have the negative comments are not the majority percentage of your audience. Right. It doesn't mean that those people aren't, I'm not in any manner, shape or form criticizing. I'm obviously criticizing trolls, people who are being negative just to be negative or to criticize or to just be assholes about things. The people in the fandom, I genuinely believe after all these years and all the fandoms that I've worked, usually those are the minorities. Unfortunately, like reviews, the only people that leave comments are the ones who are over the top excited or under the bottom. The most yes. passionate. They're exactly. they're not they're at the the trailing ends of the bell curve. Exactly. Yeah. It's not the it's not that chunk in the yeah. middle. Yeah, it's not the normies. I genuinely believe, guys, that the majority of your audiences, especially you two, are extremely discerning Stargate fans. I genuinely believe from all of the comments of being at GateCon, being overseas at the um, at the two UK cons, mm -hmm. having worked with the people in Germany, in Australia, these are pretty smart fans who know and might get excited about the rumors, but they know yeah. the bottom line, right? It's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, is this true? Ugh. You know, it, that's, right. that's your normal fan right now honestly i think the majority of stargate fans are pretty cynical which is unfortunate but i think that they have every right to be so i think that they take all of this with a ocean of salt on all of the sites whether it's us talking right now and 
everybody should take everything that I say with a notion of salt. It's based on my experience. It's based on my research. But there are 40 different points of view to what I've just talked about today. And the people that I've talked to internally have people opposite of them internally who might have different perceptions of how this is happening. And those can both be true at the same time. And that's, I think what I want all of our fans to know is all these things can be true at the same time. It's a wait and see. And it's, I know I say, oh my God. Yeah, every no, time I'm glad you say it. It's, every, it's your source works for somebody who works for somebody who works inside Mark Burnett's office. Oh my God, right? Is that M MGM doesn't want to have anything to do with Stargate. That's right. Exactly. And it's, and for years I could never say that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I couldn't even outwardly say it because I was an MGM employee, even though I was a consultant, I'm still an employee. And also just ethically, I did, I would never have felt comfortable saying that. We have that. NDAs. Exactly. You know? There is and a process that has to move forward on its own, unencumbered by exactly. us. Exactly. And might have all expired. But context is king. Yes. It, oh, context. You know, and I, look, I, it's the same thing that we talk about with Facebook, with Twitter, with, you know, the hell show that's Twitter right now. But wherever we are on social, any of us can post an article and have a one liner. And we so often assume that our audience who reads that is going to automatically understand where we were coming from. in the precise context in which we said it which and they never almost do. never happens never you have to give context of where you're coming from what your point of view was then if people want to disagree with you fine whatever but you can't get mad at people who make the wrong assumption because all you did was a one-liner posting this article about what you think is happening that ain't gonna i mean oh my mm -hmm. goodness and none of us it, it's so ironic if we post it we get mad but then if someone else posts it, we get mad, right? It's, we want it both ways. We want to be able to have that opinion, post our opinion. Why can't you understand me? I understand me so well. I know. And look, I am the worst, as these guys know. I don't need you to agree with me, but damn it, acknowledge my point. And I am I am the worst at that in an argument. But I think that one of the things that I learned with COVID is all of these things can be true. Yeah. They all can be true. And... It doesn't mean that I want all of these things to be true, but it's, and I know I say this every time, it is a wait and see game in this industry. And our job as fans is to do exactly what everybody's doing. What uh, Companion's doing 30 Days of Stargate over on Reddit. Yeah. David is doing amazing interviews every weekend and Wormhole Extreme with rewatches. And Darren is doing kick-ass articles and in-depth databases and then we've got people like sidetrack and get in the gate and uh um free fries short podcasts and tiktoks <laughs> like like rebecca davis and athena tato who does tiktoks every day about stargate these people who are doing that kind of content that keeps it alive that's our job our job is to keep saying you bet i'm up for it let's do it we may not want this description over here or this pitch, but ultimately it's our job as fans to say, we're here. We want it. Please, please pay attention to us. We are loud. We are going to buy it. We will spend money. We are here to do this. And I think that we want Stargate group that, you know, Kirsty and those guys are amazing because they are constantly there every single day. Yeah doing this yep i've got a couple uh more questions let's let's move through, through them a little bit more quickly and then we'll be done um summer uh jenny uh do you think you'll be involved in the next uh <laughs> series in some way will you try to be i know the super fans would love to see you there if they can't be well bless you um a couple things my my career has changed slightly since i was with stargate command at mgm so my focus now is i consult for ips and fandoms specifically about their franchises and how to develop fandom audiences and how to get fandoms and then also how to build relationships with those fandoms that certainly would be applicable here but amazon is a massive beast mm -hmm. and to work within amazon i would have to go through an application process for a full time job which i don't want to do um, and I've been there. I've, I've talked with people over there. I, I don't want a full-time job. To they be don't a consultant, use party consultants for the work. To be a consultant with Amazon, you have to work through one of their uh, agencies. 
So I would, oh. as of right now, they okay. don't hire consultants directly. I don't know if that's going to change, but, um, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure to be fair, my name is a little mud because it's with Stargate Command that failed. And so I, that's fine. I totally understand. That's the business. That's how it works. So I'm not sure that the people that went from MGM over to Amazon might not bring me up because that, that, um, uh, connection would be one that you want to distance yourself from you know mm. that that was then this is brand new mm. so i would understand if that was the case um you want us so to i don't it? we can hashtag it me? you want us to hashtag it we can hashtag <laughs> no 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 please please i uh, look i i would love i will answer the second part i would love to work on stargate oh, forever i you know wherever it goes whatever it does i am always going to be the one that raises my hand to answer the second part of that question, I will raise my hand. There's, I mean, I will definitely offer. But the first part of that question, no, I don't think that they would necessarily come to me off the bat because I think that that connection to the old, they're kind of done with. However, having said that, I think that it's quite probable that they would come to experts like David and Darren and others and say, would you like to come on board as a consultant because you are experts in the canon? depending on what they do for content <laughs> i right. think you I know if the content yeah if the content is very different then no i think all of us will be will be thanked <laughs> and acknowledged legends and, yeah exactly <laughs> that's it i think we will be You're legends. A legend Dave. um <laughs> but but i will raise my hand i mean you guys know me i'm never shy about raising my hand to work absolutely you so. mean you'd, you'd it'd be a missed opportunity and nothing is sadder than a missed opportunity if if you didn't so oh, well, you I never really get that. over that. So I think yeah. you should go for it. Uh, and Mama Nox Erica, if what do we, the public gators, need to do to help? Lots of us still keep up to date with SG Pages, Event Style, The Gate Companion. Is there anything else we can do at this stage? Final thoughts. I think, honestly, narrowing the focus on, and this is no offense to Brad, but to narrow our focus on we want Stargate, which I, I've noticed some of the we want Stargates and some of the others have narrowed that focus a bit. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not just about the Brad Wright canon and universe. I think we separate those two things out a little bit now. And I think what we do is we focus on supporting Gate World, supporting Sidetrack, supporting any of these that are gathering followers supporting dial the gate who brings in so much talent and showrunners and writers i think is really huge i think honestly the best thing you can do is get in new people that that is the the number one thing that i am asked right now about sci-fi is okay cool for this franchise for this ip we've got our core what's called your core audience mm. we want that next concentric circle out which would be uh sci-fi that are overlapped with Stargate. Yeah. The third concentric circle out would be things like uh, mainstream sci-fi gamers. That's what I think genuinely you need to do as a fan right now is expand our audience. We need to expand that fan base. Tell people about Dial the Gate. Tell people about Gate World. Tell them that this is not just news about what's happening or not happening, that there's amazing content to be had. Tell them about the companion, about Sidetrack. Whomever you think is worth following, you need to expand that base beyond our core audience. That's honestly, I know one of the first questions that will be asked at the table is, okay, cool, this is great, and we love what you're doing, but where are we going to get new audiences from? Yeah. Who knows whom? And mm -hmm. I imagine the performance of the shows on Prime Video is going to be a huge part of that equation. When yeah. it gets people sitting down at the table, so is it is it significant that we continue to encourage new viewers to go and watch the show? Oh my God, yes, on, on Prime Video. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a given. Sorry, I should have said that right out of the gate, Darren. That's spot on. I, I love <laughs> you. Always get me on the business ones. I've got. Well, it. No, we know we know that they're looking for data. So think yeah, about where Amazon executives are going to go to find data about, and that's stuff. where that's where they're going to look. Yeah, absolutely. You're spot on, and I, I think. My default for fandom is always to look at where where our fans out doing their own stuff. So mm -hmm. there's the Stargate TikTok is insane. I mean, I don't know if you guys really? have looked at it, but it, oh my god, it is insane. 
and it is phenomenally creative. So it's, if you want to look at an example that grew its audience, um, the overlap with cosplayers and gamers is huge on TikTok. And wow. there are people that you didn't, we didn't even know existed wow. that were out there and have been out there, but now have used TikTok. To that end, I'm not sure that people are pushing to watch it on Amazon. And Darren, you're spot on because they will definitely look at the uh, the social and the platforms and the, the fans and your guys' channels, but their, their absolute uh, Bible is going to be their own data. Interesting. I, I got to tell you guys, I had uh, uh, my 20th high school reunion uh, a few months ago and yeah. uh, shout out to Jay Francois, uh, who I, was uh, my classmate in kindergarten. He went to a Catholic oh. school. And I went to public school, and then, so, long the short, I hadn't seen him since kindergarten. He found he just found Stargate a few months before, oh my gosh. a few months ago, <laughs> and was around season two watching it, and found out my involvement with the the franchise as a reporter. He's now on season nine. He's dived headfirst into the franchise. Oh, I love and it. He loves it. And so, I, I mean, that. this guy's my age, you know, this guy's yeah. almost 40 and there, the, you never know who's out no. there, who's going to fall in love with the, with the franchise. You never know. Well, and and they, he, he and was watching my show and he awesome. said, I just watched your episode with Terrell Rothery. I'm stopping. I'm stopping until oh. I finish watching the, the, oh, <laughs> the Stargate it. content. Then I'll watch your dial of the gate. Cause I don't want to get that. spoiled anymore. Cause he hadn't seen heroes yet. So. Oh geez. Oh, oh Lord. God. Was that funny? But that's true. And it's, you don't know what the amount of uh, reach that you guys have. Right. What you can do by saying, guys, look, let we need to stop looking at them as adversaries, which I don't know necessarily that we were as a group, but there is that feeling of us versus them. That unfortunately, because of who MGM was, that ended up being that way a lot. This is brand new day. This, mm. this is brand new day. For every single one of these people, from Chris Burton, for Chris Ottinger, for Michael Wright, it's a brand new day walking in there. I don't know if, if Stargate is going to be what they pull out of their hip first, but for us as fans, it's a brand new day. So let's look at Amazon as a partner as opposed to an adversary. Let's look at MGM as part of Amazon, who's there and who has said, and, and it hasn't been bullshit. David and I have been there in meetings with execs that are on the board saying Stargate was our top three strategy mm -hmm. for IP franchises, period. And this was in 2017. Jewel in the crown. Whether or not it happened was because of a variety of variables that we couldn't yep. control. But it doesn't change the fact that the intent was there. Mm -hmm. And Amazon has that same intention. So let's look at them as brand new day, brand new partner, we have people coming from MGM that we know for a fact have supported Stargate in the past. It's part of the strategic part, um, strategic franchises that they want to do. Okay, then let's support the people that would make those decisions. To Darren's point, watch it on Amazon. I will have it on in the background during the day. I already do. Because it's fun for me to have that. I have to have white noise when I work. So I just turn it on in the background, knowing that that's being tracked. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I should have been recommending that to people like, Hey, I've got other friends that do that, that have never seen it. Is it still showing up as a, as a channel that you can watch on, um, on the, the top device at the, um, oh. the top devices. Oh, what was it called? Yeah. What was it? Was it sling? No, I can't. Yeah. Is I can't remember. Sling? I don't okay. know. I think it was sling, but yeah, I don't know. I didn't look that up. I should have, because that's, that's important to know mm -hmm. where else is it. And Darren, I know you do this uh, quarterly is where is it that you can find it? And, uh, what are those um, streamers as well as OTTs? Mm -hmm. um, I know Roku has it on several channels. So, Good. you know, it's something yeah, that you can find. SG-1 just left Netflix in the U.S. Uh, this past week. And yeah. so my radar is up next to see if the Hulu deal for Atlantis is going to be allowed to lapse. Yeah. I, you know, and look, that's, that's part of this whole <laughs> insane. Um, I'm just looking. Really I don't cool. know how you keep up with the, where do I watch? 
Like I, <laughs> I would have deleted that page, Darren, a long time ago. Once a month, I, I just go and oh. check everybody. And every once in a while, somebody will beat me, and they'll post it on Reddit, and they'll say, "Hey, there's a flag up on Hulu that says right. the show's leaving in two weeks." Wow. Right, and it's you know, and and we get the countdown. I don't know. This time it could. This time could be the time that Hulu says, especially because of who they're owned by now. Yeah. I mean, I, honestly, that's that incredibly convoluted. I don't know how Chris Ottinger kept track of it because that was a nightmare. Um, and Kyla, I, I don't know how they did it because I, I, Excel. I, I would have killed somebody. I just yeah. couldn't handle it. It was insane. Um, I would have walked. That would not be my job ever. No. The spreadsheets are nuts. So I don't know. You know, some of the things that I was surprised at was like the Australia deal that was renewed. That was renewed in 2022 earlier this year. I was kind of surprised. Like, really? You're going to renew that? They have I data. Thought Mm-hmm. I thought you'd let, let everything lapse and then start over, yeah. but of course not because of what you guys have said, which is they've got the data and if they see it succeeding and they're making money on the backside out of a percentage, then why not? They, yeah, they and literally don't have later. to do anything. We and they don't have to do the marketing. Right. right. And I know that they're looking at a Twitch deal for content. So you, there's all kinds of distribu- distributors, which David, you and I did that Twitch deal for Atlantis. It was extremely popular. I mean, nothing came of it because it just was during the transition. Mm. But, you know, you just don't know where things are going to be and what they're going to let go and what contracts they're going to let lapse. And that's just it as fans, you know, don't be one to, I mean, you can, of course, if you want to, it's either, it's Brad or bust or I'm not interested. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, okay. Then, you know, what, what could have been if you would have watched this other thing that they would have later come back and said, okay, so this thing in the mid, in the mid time that was of a quality right. product. All right, right. It was successful. Brad, what else you got? Maybe we can weave right. things in. Don't just, don't just shut off your opportunities. Well, and ironically origins, as much as it wasn't what we wanted to be made over a million dollars. So, you know, for something that was not expected to do that well, and that right. was, didn't it premiere yeah, but, like on top on iTunes or something? Something yeah, like crazy. And, yeah. And it was, so. it was insane. And it was on the OTT list for about three months. Right. So, I, you know, I think, again, proof in the pudding that yeah. the fans will, will go for anything. And, and I do think that we're lucky and that while a lot of us are like, oh man, we want this to be in the Thread Rights yeah. universe. We aren't adverse to Stargate content mm-hmm. if it can be done. And I, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that the labyrinthine approval process of like what Wyvern Gaming had to go through will be cleared the decks. Because if that can happen, that it's much more straightforward for licensees, for people pitching, then that means yeah. we'll get more content. I mean, look, maybe we'll get something in, in Roland Emmerich's universe and in the in Brad's and something new. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. I know those have all been pitched. So I don't... I, you know, Roland, I think is done, but, but who knows? Look, you have all new people. Roland could see this and go, Hey, I could come pitch. Yeah. I have, this trilogy. yeah. yeah. I have this trilogy idea. And it, look that his first movie, I saw the script. I loved it. It was amazing. And it allowed for Brad's universe to exist. So, you know, and hats off to scripted television over at MGM. They were the ones that made that happen. You never know. It could be something really cool like that that kickstarts it all off. And then Amazon says, hey, guys, stick with us for five years. We're going to make this happen. This is how it's going to arc. I know that's what they're talking about. I just don't know what it's going to be. So keep the opportunities open for yourselves. Don't cut yourselves out of the picture too quickly. Well, and it was kind of a cathartic experience to me to read Brad's tweets. and Oh, that's true. Perspective. I mean, I know he's... Uh, as much as fans have been frustrated over the last two years, just imagine how Brad's been been oh my God. coping with the the ins and outs, the ups and downs, and the the indecision. Yeah. But when he started saying, you know, this, he basically started talking about his pitch in the past tense and saying, right. "I did this. It doesn't look like it's going anywhere. It would have been fun." Right. Um, that's given me a bit of a cathartic mm-hmm. ability to let yeah. it go. Yeah, I hear you and on that so. one. I think we don't. It's not that I wouldn't hold out hope for Brad to be involved, like you said yeah, earlier, yeah. 100%. To, both of your, to both of your points, that he could be involved in some way. And that goes back to the point we made that that was the equation then. 
the equation now is different. Don't bemoan that. It's mm -hmm. not it, it's not MGM's fault. It's not Brad's fault. It's not Amazon's fault. That script was made for the group that was available then. Yep. And it isn't apropos, quite frankly, to what the strategic plan and tactical resources are at Amazon now. But we know things come back around. Uh, mm -hmm. Thrawn is pulled back into the Star Wars canon. Um, right. We thought for years that J.J.'s movies were everything that was going to be Star Trek from now on. And right. right. That's true. The last yep. five years as they've cycled this back around and integrated, you know, multiple timelines and multiple realities as part That's of right. the Star Trek universe. Well, we can argue that, but they've tried. Tried being the operative. Well, and, and whether you liked <laughs> it or not. Yeah. Whether, whatever you yeah. think creatively of, of right. JJ. It exists. Discovery, mm -hmm. Aside from whether you liked it or not. Right. It's come back around. Mm -hmm. right. so Stargate could do something very different next and then in five years come back around to something else and it's a bigger media landscape and maybe Brad's doing something over here it's still got to have a Stargate in it you know we've made that argument well, we yeah. are franchise fans we yes. being him and I and you Jenny of course yes so all right folks um wow that's a lot to <laughs> digest a lot. and assimilate yeah. um you know, what do you say we do this all again in June or May? Yeah. <laughs> See where we're well, at. I think I think we're gonna want to do it after January fifteenth. After uh, oh, really? MGM okay. Plus, yeah, I I do think. Yeah. I think they're gonna make some more strategic uh, franchise announcements. Whether okay. or not Stargate's involved, I mean, Stargate's announced as part of that. I think will be a clue for us about whether or that's not that's true. gonna happen now or later. And then um, I'm really fascinated to see, and this is again, going back to your very first question, why they fast-tracked a lot of this. I'm getting fascinated to see what Michael Wright does with MGM Plus and what his announcements are. And if if they're quiet, which look, it's the holidays, but you know, Amazon has been known to just work right through the holidays. Um, I'd be interested to see what what they do in the, the launch of MGM Plus, what announcements they make at that They've time. They've gotta come out swinging. They've uh -huh. got to with some with two or three big titles. You have to, yeah. otherwise, this this space is so friggin' cluttered. Apple Plus, Disney Plus, yeah. Peacock. You know, I yeah. mean, people only have so much band, so much you know, cash to spare in their wallets. Right. So and time and time to watch. I mean, I sure do. You have to be select. You I can't watch everything. Up on all the shows on my list. That's I exactly right. Watch. I, I, I'm sure this will come as a shock. I have a spreadsheet and <laughs> I've got all of the shows that I want to watch on it and I, I keep adding them. to it and it's ridiculous. And so I started categorizing them by not what channels they were on or streamers they were on or how I would find them, but by genre that I like. Cause then what I do is I go and I'm like, Oh, what am I in the mood for? You know, That's and true. then I can go find yeah. something. And I, you know, honestly, I, I think we're going to hear something. I, d I don't know. It could be that they go quiet and dormant because they're going to go work on it. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to come out swinging January 15th and say, we have Legally Blonde RoboCop Stargate. Good. I don't know. Have to see what I asked you this question last time, I think, Jenny, but let me ask it again. In the context of this new world that you've described to us, yeah. which is would uh, an Amazon or an MGM or an MGM Plus potentially come out and make an announcement that is a development announcement sure before a green yeah. light rather yeah. than saying hey we're gonna make a new stargate show 10 episodes here's the producer no, they, they've they been say, known to do it we're, we're actively working on something well they did that for rings of power and some would say that that was successful and some would say that that was the dumbest thing they'd ever done because what it led a lot of people to believe was that it was going to actually be directed by peter jackson what they said was it was going to be in the world of Peter Jackson. So you had a lot of misunderstandings with that announcement. And they had to, to clarify that quite a bit. Development announcements are made all the time. Everybody, I'm going to say again, read Deadline, read The Wrap. Variety gets things second, third hand. I, I don't know about them. I would say Deadline and The Wrap, they're the ones that report on the things that they're hearing. Some of them are rumors, but they won't report it or they'll say it's a rumor. That's where you'd see something in development under their TV or film silo on their sites. You know, Darren, you've got contacts. I think what's going to happen is that we're going to hear from some of our friends at Amazon and they're going to say, Hey, a development deal is in the works, but it, I mean, I'm hearing that now that there's a development deal in the works, but it can't be closed. 
because of a, a variety of different issues. I don't know if that's accurate. You know, it's it, it is it's bandied about. It could be that they've already been working behind the scenes. So this announcement that's just been made, and this is usually what happens with some of the big corporations with its acquisitions, they've just made this structural and restructural announcement and how MGM is going to be woven. And they've already been working in the background, developing the sci-fi, fantasy, procedural and mystery thrillers that they want to do, taking a meeting with Ryan Johnson. Like we know that happened, what they discussed, you know, whatever. So I think they could come out January 15th and say, here's what's on MGM plus MGM plus that's going to happen right now. And here's what's in development that you'll see either on prime video or on MGM plus. It depends on, I think two things, what their PR comms people tell them and what the data tells them. Shows like this, people like uh, you guys on what you're doing weekly, the companion sidetrack talking every week about it. It may be that they see this and their data of who's watching Stargate on Amazon Prime, and they'll say, you know what? We need to make a development announcement. People are waiting. Mm -hmm. They do look at that. Their comms mm -hmm. people look at that every day. And then they have huge arguments in the marketing meeting with the research people and the marketers who say, we have no content, no assets, we can't do anything. So, you know, <laughs> it depends on how those conversations go. My, my, my favorite one always as being part of the content production and marketing content team, which is where I've always been, was, okay, we're going to make this announcement. Okay, do you have assets? <gasps> no, can't you make a logo in two days? No, we can't, unless you have a lot of money. Yeah. And then that's when we get the buck 99 cup of Joe. This is what we got. What can you do for this? So, and that's not Amazon. You know, mm -hmm. Amazon could turn it around. They've got internal people. John Zeffirano, who we know from way back, He's in charge of their internal AV department. So he does mm. all the trailers. He does all of the coming, all the development. He does all of that content. He does the clip shows, all of that. You know, if, if they tell him, hey, this is coming up, the first thing he's going to say is, and what am I using for content? Right. What are my <laughs> and and they it could be killed. The announcement could be killed based on not having assets. Real all of the fun details. Real quick, Jenny, what are you watching right now? I am binging. Uh, I, I'm in a whole thing of uh, procedurals and stuff like that. So I'm binging Equalizer, Fire Country. Um, I'm also watching The Peripheral, which is phenomenal. Oh, okay. um, I just started Wednesday over on Netflix, which I love. Is it good? Um, okay. And then, uh, shoot, what was the other thing I just started on Amazon? The peripheral, but there was another one too that was really good. I'm blanking. You do oh, all Hannah, those simultaneously? Okay. Well, I, it depends on what I'm in the mood for. Okay. Right. Hannah, so, you said. Hannah, which is okay. it's been on for a while, but it's amazing. Okay. Darren, what am I watching right now? Yeah. My family was out of town for a while, so I decided to catch up on a bunch of movies, and I realized I stopped watching movies like before I the know, pandemic. Right? So I rewatched Blade Runner, and so that mm. I can finally watch Blade Runner 2049. Oh, cool. Did you like it? Uh, yeah, I liked it a lot. I think it improves on the original. I, I watched Dune for the first time. Oh, oh. the second one. Uh, That's a good movie. But uh, you know, yeah. all my sci-fi friends told me that the third season of The Orville is exceptional television, and yeah. I've been holding on to it. And I have one episode left, and let me tell you, that is a stellar show. In season three, what do you think of Domino? I'm sorry, Domino. that's one of the other ones. I started and I haven't Domino's finished good. the third season. Yeah. And then um, I'm not as big a Star Trek fan as you guys. And so I should include this is that I am simultaneously catching up on Discovery, New Worlds, Prodigy, Prodigy and Lower Tricks. Because <laughs> I don't always watch them when you guys, and also because I want to see, is it going to get picked up? Does it? That's true too. I don't, I don't bother if it's a one season cliffhanger. It's like, well, that's nice. I'm sure it was a great story. Season three um, of I'm doing that. of the Orville was season three is excellent television and like the final the final episode episode is like you know what if they they don't do another season I'm okay with it because of how it ends the final episode of Orville is kind of like a this is why we do sci-fi oh. this is why we love sci-fi kind of episode okay then I got to make sure to push that up on my list I just watched 1899 just just I inhaled oh, it what? in about four oh. days I've been watching the post. development of this show since they first yeah. announced it because they're using the volume heavily yeah 
I loved it. I Did loved you? it 100. You know, okay. my favorite show of all time is a mystery box show, Lost. Um, yeah. It's 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 very much that there'll there'll be three seasons of around eight episodes each. It ends at a very nice act one finish. Um, okay, cool. And you go through it going like, wow, this is a mind bender. And then you get to it yeah. near the end of it, and it's like, okay, this is nicely parked for a year and a half. So, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, that one in the peripheral, I've kind of been eyeing and the thinking peripheral? maybe when the season I is. I loved done. the peripheral. Oh my God. I it just is started Andor tonight. So, and oh, Andor will be well, my next one because they just finished okay. it. So. Andor last and night. Then, uh, and then, okay, you finished so Andor finished, last night? Just last night, I watched okay. the last one. It's, it's we another, finished it another, on last Wednesday. It we aired last Andor. Wednesday. I watched yeah. it last night. And you're and happy with it? Another one of those. They parked season one in a really nice spot. Okay. I agree. Deeply satisfying. Yeah, Alexis it's Cruz. Told, me, nobody's told Star Wars stories like this before. No. Yeah. And it it is absolutely beautifully written. And it isn't one of those things like Rings of Power, you have a tendency to look at the writing, the acting, and the production value separately. That's and true. or I didn't look at those separately. It was immersed. And so the You don't writing, have time to. Acting, you're you're enjoying the, the world, process. You're, the world you're is immersed. just so lived in. Wow. But also Tales of the Jedi are really good. I've heard it's good. Really good. I've heard really, it's really good. good, especially if you like to get the holes kind of gaps filled in yeah. Rebels and yeah. Clone Wars. I'm glad that they're doing an anthology series because yeah. Tales is really good. It's really good. And, and Visions was gorgeous. Oh my god! If you're a droid fan, Andor, Andor, I they did yeah. a a sequence with the droid late in the season. No spoilers, yeah. but I was welling up. Yeah. Wow. They made yeah. me love droids. <laughs> there was a great, there's a great podcast. If you guys aren't listening to it by Laura Kelly um, about star Wars and she does a great assessment. I'm blanking out what the name of her podcast was. Um, and Laura it's Kelly, Laura Kelly. And it's, it's ugh, I'm completely blanking. And she did a great sequence talking up, about, Laura. That yeah, that's her. But I forget what her podcast Forced is. Force toast. Force toast. She and her co-hosts talked about the development, emotional development of droids, and how they've been handled in the different uh, movies and television shows. Mm. And it was so beautiful. It's such a great assessment and analyzation. So if you guys get a chance, it's it's part of the Andor assessment. Um, okay, yeah, review. I would listen to the hell out of that. Yeah. Okay. It's it's really interesting and um and then if, for you two especially check out visions well actually anybody I want to see creative, visions anybody yeah. who's creative in our audience who's into Star Wars or actually even if you're not into Star Wars visions is the coolest anthology that I think they've ever done since the Janati uh, Star Wars clones original art that right was done yeah the the one that was out back in the day and yeah. it is. It is so cool. And the first group were, I think, all Japanese mm -hmm. uh, artists and directors and storytellers. But and some of them I liked, some of them I didn't. But it's it Animatrix. Is, it's it's it Animatrix. Is so cool. Yeah. It is so gorgeous. So I highly recommend it for anybody who is a cosplayer, creative, an animator, a drawer, an illustrator, or just plain a huge fan of those things. Um, you know, I'm not a cosplayer, and I saw like five things that I would have dressed up as in a second. <laughs> All right, there we go, guys. Thank you so much for for doing this once again. <laughs> so, we um, went two and a half hours. Oh my god! I know. I so it's bad. like I'm never going to be able to sustain them for this, and here we are. So I'm, hey, I'm so this. sorry. No, I'm are you kidding me? This is good. Oh, no, you're okay. a resource. Let me just say, my top line takeaway from this conversation is, even if the next Stargate is not. It doesn't come from Brad's typewriter. Amazon is is looking to do something big. It's not a little property that's going to fade away, and we're going to have to keep ringing the bell and knocking on the door, saying, "Hey, no. we matter too." Amazon yeah. is currently strategizing mm -hmm. to go big, and when they yes. when they do yeah. go for it, we we better be ready. You know, yeah. we better be ready to respond because if we don't, and they don't, you know, get the audience. Who knows when there will be another project? Yeah, again. and my gut is that the, the, that this is this window of opportunity. And Darren, yeah, I, I mean, again, it's based on the information we have right now. That is my feeling, and that's my gut feeling. And I think that we have a window of opportunity. Yep. 
Thank you guys. Jenny Stiven of Cleo Consulting, Darren Sumner of Gate World. Thank you. You guys have uh, Jenny will be back with you. For, you and I will be back for with trivia. trivia. That's right. Darren, have a wonderful holiday, okay? Happy you holidays. Too. You guys take care Happy of yourselves. Holidays, Bye, guys. Bye-bye. We'll see you in 2023. Sounds good. Darren Sumner of Gate World and Jenny Stiven of Clio Consulting. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you found that informative. Um, you may have to go back and watch it again because there's a lot of information uh, there. Uh, I had a couple of questions as a holdover. Jeremy Heiner, are you familiar with the YouTube channel Space Doc? They do a lot of Starship breakdowns, including Stargate ships. It would be a fun interview to collaborate with. I am aware of Space Doc. Um, I should reach out to them and see if they'd be interested in doing with something. Teresa MC, what are the top authentic props you would like to add to your collection? Oh, man. Um, that I don't already have? something really i don't know there's I, i'm pretty fortunate in terms of the stargate front in terms of props so i don't i can't think of anything i'm in a really happy place maybe some art i'm a bit of an art fanatic um i was recently invited to take part in Treknological, a star trek shakedown podcast where i contributed uh to the star trek 3 search for spock co-captains uh, commentary and um it was a really uh fun time and i have to say uh being with uh, my buddy justin again uh vactor and his buddy shaf uh was uh was a terrific uh episode so if you want to be a part of uh that and tuning in with them you're more than welcome to go to uh technological that link is in the description below for this uh episode and i believe i am in um which one am i in i think i'm in the one for december the first so that's where you can find me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to everyone who contributed to this episode. Uh, my moderating team, uh, my producer, Linda Gategabber Fury, you are the best. Summer, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy, Reese, and Anthony, you guys make the show possible week after week. Frederick Marcoux, my web developer for Dial of the Gates, uh, helping me keep everything running over there. You can visit dialthegate.com. It has all of the current shows listed for the rest of the year ready to go. I think that's uh, all that I've got for you guys. Hope you found this episode informative. I really appreciate everyone who, who, who tuned in. Uh, we were at 130 uh, concurrent viewers for, for the top. Uh, this is uh, a series that continually uh, performs well. So thank you again, Jenny, for all of your analysis. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. I'll see you on the other side.